Hashem Hashem Nasev and Atzliach, Shiru Torah, Bukhim Abayim. We are uh, back here on our Wednesday night, Stump the Rabbi. We're after a little bit of Divrei Torah. Bezot Hashem, uh, you guys will ask some questions. Uh, Kadosh Baruch Hu will give us the answers, Bezot Hashem. And uh, tonight's uh, Shiru will be a uh, Refua Shlema for Orit Bat Esther, Rabbanit uh, Levana Bat Sarah, Rabbi Ephraim Ben Shulamit, Rabbanit Sarah Bat Anat, Avi uh, Mori David Ben Nasria, Imi Morati Doris Bat Jora, and also for a Atzlacha uh, Raba for uh, Marsha Bat Julie, Ayla Bat Marsha, Samuel Ben Marsha, Sefas Ben Marsha, Alexander Ben Marsha, Louis Ben Marsha, and also Atzlacha Raba and Refua Shlema to Irada Chaya Manashirova, Mark Gabriel Manashirov, uh, Manashir Adinyayev, uh, Chaim Adinyayev. Irina Miriam Manashirov. Kadosh Baruch Hu Yivarech Otam Bekol Mikol Kol Chaim Arukim Shlemim Eliim Torah Mitzvot Gminut Chasidim Bracha Ba'Azlacha B'Kol Ma'asei Adem To them and to all of the uh, righteous people that continue to uh, learn with us as we uh, aspire to become holy day after day. So a little bit of update, uh, some things that are going on, Baruch Hashem. We have uh, a lot of shiurim, a lot of uh, good stuff coming out in the, uh, recently in the last uh, couple of weeks. Baruch Hashem, we have a... Uh, a bunch of things that are going to be added to the uh, stores uh, in the uh, in the near future, Bezod Hashem. So keep uh, an eye out for that. Also for um, anybody that wants to get the uh, uh, the best uh, updates on a regular basis uh, each day, Chizuk, sign up to our WhatsApp groups simply by sending us a text message after answering some basic questions to ensure that you're not a missionary. We'll add you to one of our groups, and that way you'll have instant Torah each day where you get updates. The best way to watch our shurim, I always remind you guys, is either on bh.live, which if you have a desktop, you go to bh, as b as in Be'ezrat, h as in Hashem, dot l-i-v-e, bh.live, that's the best place to watch our shurim live. Uh, you could also watch our shurim if you want to, on a desktop, if you want to avoid uh, going to YouTube, go to um, bhtorah.org, bhtorah.org. Uh, that's the uh, whole terminal over there, Baruch Hashem, of our many shiurim. Now, of course, if you're using a smartphone like the vast majority of people in the world, then simply download our app. Download the app, and uh, that way you'll have not only the, uh, the shiurim available to you, but you also have the live feed available to you soon, Bezat Hashem. Uh, we will, uh, you know, make an effort to get back to answering questions again. It's been several months since we uh, answered questions on the app. Simply the amount of questions and work uh, elsewhere are uh, just uh, impossible to catch up to. Uh, as Also, as a, a special favor, I ask for all of you wonderful people that send me messages. Uh, when you ask questions, I enjoy the questions. I appreciate the questions. I love answering them. But some of you... Uh, may Hashem give you health and success and a lot of good. Send me messages with absolutely nothing. Like, how are you? Or you just send me something that you saw in the news. Please stop sending me those messages. It takes a lot of time to look at the messages. It wastes a lot of time. I already get somewhere between 400 to 600 uh, messages per day. And when you send me another 20, 30, 40, 50 messages per day to tell me about something that went on, that's not really something that I can do anything about, it doesn't really do any good, not for you and not for the other people that are waiting to get my attention. So please try to make sure that whatever messages you send me are short, they're to the point, you need help, you need to have a question, I'm more than happy to help you. If it's not something like that, don't send it. Don't send it, how are you? If you see me in Shurim, that means I'm alive. Baruch Hashem, thank you very much for asking. But it's more important for you to uh, learn Torah than ask about my well-being. Because if you see me online, that means that I'm well enough to give Shiru. That's already good enough, Baruch Hashem. I appreciate it. I appreciate the gesture. But all of these extra messages, some of you send me 40, 60, 70 messages a day. And I simply just put you on spam. Not, no offense to you, it's just simply, I can't, I can't look at your messages anymore. I can't decipher, you know, which one is valid, which one is good, which one is not. I just don't have the time for it. So please do me a favor and do Ami Sayla a favor. Don't send me messages that I can't do anything about. Uh, also, for, for, for those of you that are on Terror Watch, you know, the Heretic Watch, you guys are looking for Shirim. Uh, that, uh, you know, that other people make, and then you ask me questions about it. Oh, isn't what he said heretical? Isn't what he said terrible? 
don't send me those shilim anymore. It's enough. I'm tired of it. If it's uh, loud enough, I'll pay attention to it. But generally speaking, I don't have any patience for it. And quite frankly, you should not have time for it. You should not be watching shulim of anyone that's not a strong speaker. Simple. Don't ask me if I approve a rabbi. Don't approve a rabbi. I don't approve anyone that's a, uh, against the Torah. Simple. If the person that you're listening to is not a strong speaker that speaks the truth, then you already know my opinion. You, you know the Torah's opinion. And that's it. If, they, if you want to listen to people because you like to hear heretical things, then your blood is in your hands, uh, just like this week's parasha says. So with that being said, I understand that some of you got offended by it, but it's not to offend you, it's to help you. That's the whole point of why we're here. And also one of the things that we see has happened over the last couple of days, Baruch Hashem, our dear brothers from Chabad have uh, spent an exhausted amount of time, exhausting amount of time attacking me in the last couple of days since the uh, uh, shiul from last week was publicized and then somebody took a clip from the shiul where I discussed Chabad and uh, uh, they only took one, in- one minute out of 16 minutes that I discussed it. And, of course, it went viral. They've been calling me, emailing me. I think if they were able to send me doves, they would send me doves. It's unbelievable. 24 hours a day, curses, screams, insults. You could just see part of the comments that are on the internet uh, about it. And it's not all the comments. I've erased many of them because they simply have potty mouths and uh, a lot of uh, uh, idolatrous practices, to, to, to say the least. And unfortunately, this is a sad, sad, sad uh, event uh, because the history of Chabad, as I said in the shiur, the history of Chabad is unbelievable. Unfortunately, today's Chabad and yesterday's uh, Chabad are two different things, are two different, two different organizations. And what I'm talking about when I say people are heretical, it's because they're heretical. It's not because I have anything against any particular person. It's not a personal issue. It's simple. Torah says A, somebody does B, we, uh, if, if it's necessary, if we get the permission from our rabbis, we have to, uh, you know, we have an obligation to rebuke. We have an obligation to protest. Now, of course, people are going to send me all of their, uh, their, uh, their uh, ideologies, trying to teach us and send me all types of clips from the Rebbe. And as if that's going to help, Rabotai, there's Torah, we need to learn it, and Be'ezot Hashem, we will. And again, one of the things that a Jew is supposed to aspire to be, a Jew is supposed to aspire to be Kadosh. That is what a Jew is supposed to aspire to be. And of course, many people aspire to look Kadosh, to look Kadosh, but to act Kadosh are two different things. Sometimes you'll see somebody that has the, uh, the, the, the uniform. They have the black and white, they have the hat, they sport the beard, she has a mitpachat, maybe she has a wig, but nonetheless... They look, they look like they're religious, but then once you start hear them talk, then they start talking things that are heretical, like God needs you, or that all of the Jews are going to heaven, and no one is going to get punished, God loves everyone, and all types of things that are the opposite of the Torah. Or like we said in the lecture, where they have, in essence, done something terrible by taking a tzaddik, the Lubavitch Rebbe, and in essence, idolizing him. Idolizing him is, is something that didn't just start now. The idolization of the Lubavitcher Rebbe didn't just start today. This is something that's been going on for decades. In fact, Arav Shach, Allah Shalom, went uh, uh, to, to war with the uh, Lubavitcher Rebbe over several years when he had solid proof, solid proof that while he was still alive, while the Lubavitcher Rebbe was still alive, the, he had words to say to people that in essence, uh, are not allowed to be spoken, things that you're not allowed to say, things that, in essence, deified him. So Rav Shach went to war with him, tooth and nail. And Rav Ovadia, I love shalom. I have a video clip. We're actually putting some subtitles on it, Bezat Hashem, which we'll put in, in, in English. Rav Ovadia spoke about the issue as well. He has proof he, he, uh, and, and that there were problems. There were problems even while he was alive, needless to say, after he died. Now, again, we're, uh, we're, we're not here to, uh, to join the war. We're here to simply remind Am Yisrael and anybody else out there that wants to be observant of the Torah itself that our job is to be holy. To be holy means we have to connect ourselves, connect our actions to a Kadosh Baruch Hu. Make him priority number one. Make him priority number one, priority number two, priority number three, priority number five. 
everyone else, regardless of whether it's the Mashiach, it's Moshe Rabbeinu, it's the Rambam, it's the anything else is 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 secondary to Hakadosh Baruch Hu. When you hear a entire speech, or needless to say, an entire organization focus on anything but Hakadosh Baruch Hu, that is already problematic. Why? Because our people our people for the last 3300 plus years have literally died in order to sanctify kadosh bohu's name in order to honor his name in order to stay glued to him and never in history never in history have the righteous people abandoned that masoet now of course there's been mistakes throughout the years there's been false messiahs false prophets that have uh, led us astray led us to idolatry led us to uh follow a, a, a person but none of those things uh, 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 actually helped anybody be righteous. None of those things helped anyone go to heaven. None of those things helped anybody be, you know, do anything of good value. It only led people astray. There's an entire sefer over, I don't know, 1,000, 1,500 pages uh, in Hebrew that is called Mashiach Shekel. The, all of the false messiahs that we've had throughout the years. And you have horrific, horrific stories of false messiahs when people believed a charismatic leader many times there were chachamim many times there were wise people that knew how to speak to people and in one particular case that i remember off the top of my head this false messiah led an entire community an entire community to commit suicide to jump off a cliff so all types of things have happened now again i'm not comparing that to the lubavitch rebbe chas that he did that but he has many 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 and if i dare to say the majority of the public personas the people that are out there that are celebrating his name have deified him to a certain extent they have made him the priority they have all types of campaigns talking only about him and literally never mentioning god at all this is a problem especially when you see that there are still the same horrific problems within all jewish communities not just chabad when it comes to actually understanding what is kedusha what is holiness what is holy holiness is not just something that you learned from a single book holiness is not just something that you do when you get a chance to be holy is simply a life mission and a person that wants to connect to a kadosh baruch Hu has to understand that this is a priority one of the things that you'll see many times is that you'll see organizations jewish organizations uh, pop up left and right little young people trying to uh, start a, uh, a, a organization or a YouTube channel and they'll start with all types of things and many times you'll see that some of these things look good but end up bad they look like they had the good intentions but then when everyone found out that it's fee-based or it's a uh, money uh, money oriented that's the primary focus not helping people do chuva so many times you see that these things have a, uh, a good uh, advertising good marketing but in reality it's a trap like the business world so it's important for a person to know that to be holy is not something that requires money to be holy is is, is your own personal servitude to HaKadosh Baruch Hu by following the instructions that HaKadosh Baruch Hu and his Chachamim have put into the world we're going to go over some of these things because it has everything to do with our parasha, as it always does. Everything is always in a parasha. And Bezot Hashem, Nasev and Atzliach. Now, you have a, the, the weekly parasha, Parashat Kedoshim, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, Kedoshim tiyu ki Kedoshani. You be holy because I am holy. Of course, we discussed this last week where Am Yisrael is a holy nation, but we can never be holy like HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So what does that mean? We have to do certain things in order to emulate HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Now, of course, the beginning of the parasha starts talking about the issues of korbanot. And then later on, all types of uh, you know corrupt businesses. And then later on, a continuation of last week's parasha, Parashat Achremot, that talks about the issues of what we call Kedusha. Kedusha meaning the uh, uh, the issues of morality uh, or immorality as uh, as as unfortunately today has become standard now the question is what do these things have to do with each other what is the details of how to bring a korban whether to do this or to do that have anything to do with the issues of Kedusha and the beautiful thing is is that everything in a, in a Torah always connects the Torah is the spiritual nervous system of humanity, of the world. 
It's what a Kadosh Baruch Institute in the world that always connects, that always has everything to do with everything. The more you learn, the more you'll be able to connect more dots to it. So in the beginning of the parasha, you have a uh, uh, Torah says, Translation, you have a situation here where the Torah talks about bringing a korban. This is in the beginning of the parasha. It's a chapter uh, uh, 19, verse number 7, where the Torah says, but if it shall be eaten on the third day, it's a pigul, and it will not be accepted. Any one of those who eat it will bear his sin for he has desecrated and the consecrated offering of Hashem that soul will be cut off from its people so here Rashi discusses it and Onkelos elaborates further or vice versa actually Onkelos discusses it and Rashi elaborates further where Onkelos says that here we have two different two different things being discussed first the Torah says if somebody brings a korban, but the intent of the one that's slaughtering it is that it shall be eaten on the third day, then that korban is rejected. It will be considered a pigul and will not be effective for appeasement. Secondly, it says that one who eats it will incur liability for his sins, for he has desecrated the consecrated offering of Hashem that person will be eliminated from his people so these are two different things even though they seem like they're one and the same they're two completely different issues one issue rashi explains is that if the one that's slaughtering it's bringing this koban he's about to slaughter it but he's thinking you know what i don't feel like eating steak today i don't feel like eating steak today uh i know i only have a limited amount of time to eat this koban it's really not for me i'm in the mood for maybe uh chicken Maybe I'm in the mood for, uh, you know, uh, maybe some uh, shakshuka, maybe some spaghetti and meatballs. I'm not in the mood for, for, for this. Or better yet, the guy that brought the korban, the guy that brought the korban himself, he is not sorry about his sin. He doesn't actually care. In fact, he is upset about the fact that he has to spend $25,000 on a cow because he made a sin accidentally. Because if you made the sin intentionally, then it's a uh, it's death penalty. It's not uh, there's no korban for intentional sins. The uh, the korbanot, the, the sacrifices are for accidental sins. So he doesn't really he's not really sorry. Akadosh Baruch Hu knows what's in our heart. Akadosh Baruch Hu knows what's in our mind. This is part of our thirteen principles of fate, and that korban is not accepted. It's called a pigul, either because the one that's slaughtering it. And, or, or the one that the Kohen is not intending on doing it the right way he's not going to eat it in the time that he's supposed to eat he doesn't have the right intentions the right kavanot or the one that actually brought it as a sacrifice he does not have the right intentions he's not sorry he's not looking to honor Hashem he's just trying to fit in within the community he doesn't want people to say oh this guy doesn't go to the Beit Mikdash. he doesn't want people to say Lashon about him or bad things so he pretends like he's playing along Unfortunately, you see that a lot today where people can come to synagogue every single day and while everybody else is praying, they're talking. You ask the guy, when did you actually have time to pray? He goes, no, no, don't worry, I prayed, I prayed, I prayed at home. So why'd you come to synagogue? To socialize? Yeah, exactly, I like it. So you have a lot of situations like this where you have, in every community, you'll have somebody that is not really connecting to the mitzvot, but he still pretends to be religious, still looks religious, she still looks religious, but they're as far away from HaKadosh Baruch Hu as idolatry. On the other hand, you have a situation after the first situation, Akadosh Baruch Hu says, that Koban, it's worth nothing. He just wasted $25,000. It's, a, it's, a, uh, it's not accepted. But that's where, that's the punishment. Meaning, he's not, there's no death penalty to anybody. Nobody's going to get whipped. Nothing. That's it. It's just, you wasted money. You wasted time. That's where the punishment ends. On the other hand, Rashi says, is that if somebody makes this makes the sacrifice the right way but he the uh, the guy had the right intentions he brought this he brought the uh the, the cow he brought the sheep he brought it he had the right intentions but the Kohen, he said you know what i'm full i don't feel like eating you know i'm gonna eat it 
I'm gonna eat it in a couple of days. It's a lot. It's too much to eat. I'm not gonna eat it. I'm gonna eat it in a couple of days. Yeah, but the Torah says you're not allowed. The Torah says you have a limited amount of time to eat it. You can't eat it after that. And if you eat it after that, you have a very serious problem. What's a serious problem? The problem is he'll be eliminated from his people. He'll be eliminated from his people. Shem Yishmael You're talking about karet. He saw karet. So the question is, question number one, why aren't they the same punishment? On one hand, the first guy, he didn't have the right intentions. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, you don't have the right intentions, I'm not even going to let you in. The second guy had the right intentions, but the the uh, the Kohen ate it after he was supposed to eat it. That's karet. We're talking about a world apart in punishment. There's a very, very big variance here. We're not talking about one guy got, you know, a one year in jail, the other guy got two years in jail. We're talking about one guy got, for lack of a better word, waste of time punishment meaning he wasted time that was his punishment he wasted money that was his punishment but that's it that's where it ends it's not karet it's not death penalty it's not a uh a malkot. he's not getting whipped nothing there's not even a pishkevil that's going to go on the walls of the community saying this guy did something wrong that's it it ends there akadosh bachu is not interested in your koban why he didn't have the right intentions and the other hand the guy that simp he had the right intentions but the second guy ruined it because he ate it 15 minutes after he was supposed to one minute after he was supposed to one minute after he's allowed to eat it he ate it karet we're talking about a world of difference between the two punishments why it's very simple a kadosh baruch Hu judges everything precisely and anyone the gemara says anyone that says that a kadosh baruch Hu vatran a kadosh baruch Hu is just gonna let things go he doesn't care yeah he wasted some seed yeah he, he violated some shabbat yeah he ate a few non-kosher sandwiches here and there yeah he was with the nida but she ended up being his wife anyway yeah this yeah that but you know what Rab? hashem understands hashem needs him anyway he does his mitzvot hashem needs these mitzvot anyone that says things like this aside from being a kofer a kadosh baruch Hu will punish him extra why Kadosh Baruch Hu doesn't forgive anything doesn't let go of anything if you don't do tshuva for a sin you have a punishment waiting for you it's there is no such thing as no punishment if a person doesn't do tshuva there is no such thing there's no such thing as a person going up to Shemaim with a boatload of sins and he's not going to get punished for them even if he has a boatload of, of mitzvot he'll get rewarded for the mitzvot or get punished for the avirot to think for a moment that everyone is going to heaven no matter what despite their sins especially the 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 cardinal sins the idolatrous sins the the Chilul Shabbat sins the Chilul Hashem sins the the all of those sins if a person doesn't do full tshuva for those sins a Kadosh Baruch is not letting go of those things there is no such thing as a Kadosh Baruch is gonna pass so here a Kadosh Baruch also shows us the difference the first guy wanted to enter but he really didn't have the right covenant he didn't really have good meaning he was just coming in here to make some money he was coming in here to get some fame he was coming in here to take advantage of people I don't even want to talk to him I don't want to talk to him get out of my face finished not interested you just wasted all the money to put this whole thing together no Seattle Dishmaya the other guy he put everything together but his partner the Kohen said you know what I'm not hungry I'm gonna eat it a day later I'm gonna eat it a minute late you have a karet sin why because the first one the first one never got into the door in order to become holy in the first place that Koban never became holy why it was bad intentions from from the first minute it was bad intentions from the first one so it was never holy to begin with the second one that koban was holy and when you desecrate something holy even if it's by a single second you have made yourself enemy number one with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. to to understand the, the the application of this to to our day-to-day life if a person let's say for example decides you know what this book I don't feel like reading this book I don't feel yeah but it has Torah in it yeah Torah no Torah not for me 
you have a problem you have a problem but it's not the worst problem in the world as long as you go and read other Torah do mitzvot don't go crazy you don't like this author you don't like the speaker okay fine you're entitled to have a free choice to who you like to read and who not but another guy that sends me a message and because of his anger and how upset he is at something that apparently I said at one of the shurim whether it's the Lubavitcher Rebbe or the Chabad or something else and shows me that he received a copy of my book and he threw it in the garbage that person literally just committed spiritual suicide I feel bad for him I didn't even say I honestly for me it's very upsetting because it's like simply you took a kid you took my child and you put it in the garbage you put it in the garbage my question is why would you do that now you don't like it fine give it to somebody else give it to somebody else why take something that you didn't pay for why take something that doesn't belong to you even why take Torah from the world and decide to throw it in the garbage simply because you don't like who's on the cover this is a very serious problem we have and one of the things that I've noticed Rabotai, is that in the last few days it's a repeat offense to what I saw over the last several years anytime I've mentioned Chabad is that the response the response that you get from certain Chabad rabbis that publicize their name in their comments and certain people from the congregation the response is such a desecration of a kadosh Baruch Hu's name literally was better off for those people to never be born why you see the things that they say the animosity the animosity that they have towards anyone that has a different opinion than them you're amazed you're amazed that the public does not notice this because everyone notices oh they love everybody everybody that agrees with them the moment you violate their three principles of faith the Rebbe is Mashiach the wig is number one uh, a, uh, this is uh, especially uh, important and uh, it's either Chalav Israel or the beard depending on uh, on where you go the second you say anything anything against any of these principles of faith that they've they've declared for themselves the comments that they make literally show more animosity than even the Christians have towards us Christian missionaries that hate us no less than the Nazis do not respond in the same fashion and they do it publicly they do it in such a loudly proudly and this Rabotai is a very serious crime this in itself shows that there is a problem even greater than what we've mentioned now if a person disagrees no problem no problem you can disagree you can agree there are different ways to do it but to go and publicly insult to call people names to uh, to do all types of things it's, it's this is not a place for it to do it proudly on the internet to call to have an entire team of lunatics simply spam your phone 24 hours a day calling you at all hours of the night text messaging face mask, all types of things calling multiple numbers all, doing all types of things this is a sick this is a sick group of people now of course this is not all of Chabad or else I would have to change my phone number because simply the phone would break but but nonetheless I've seen this time and time again and you see here that when it comes to the issues of holiness we're far we're far from where we need to be because a Kadosh Baruch Hu says there are certain things you don't have to be a part of if you don't want to be a part of there are certain things that if they are good you don't like them you don't but if they're good but you come and try to destroy it you come and try to ruin it you have a very serious problem with a Kadosh Baruch Hu. you have a very serious problem with a Kadosh Baruch Hu. 
And that's one of the things that I thought to myself. With this guy, he sends me a picture of him throwing my book into the garbage. If you didn't like my book, no problem. No problem. Don't read it. If you didn't read it, I would know. In fact, even if you didn't like it, and you didn't like me, so much so that you threw it in the garbage, why do you have to send me the picture to do that, to, to show me that? What do you get out of that? To show that you're throwing the book in the garbage. What, what do you get out of that? That, Rabotai, is evil. That's evil. That is the way of the ISIS terrorists that show people videos of them slaughtering their, their children or their husbands and their wives and so on. This is a spiritual terrorist. And unfortunately, Rabotai, this is well-accepted behavior. This is well-accepted behavior. Now, if you start looking at what the Chachamim say in comparison to what the behavior out there is, you'll see there's a world of difference. We're not going to talk much about Chabad. We're going to talk about Kedusha. But I want you to understand that there is a little bit, a little bit of poison in the water here. And we're trying to figure out where lies, where is the root of the problem. I thought that I discussed it, but it seems like there are other issues. There are other issues. Even people from the community that are decent people have contacted me and told me, listen, what you're talking about is 100% right, but it's not even scratching the surface of the problem. You're saying that there's not a lot of chachamim coming out of the community? Yeah, that's probably because before they start studying and after they start studying, they have these Fabrigans and everybody gets drunk. They literally drink two minutes before they start praying or they start learning to well, drink alcohol. Every few minutes, they go outside smoking things that are not exactly cigarettes. Now again, this is not everywhere. But if you have members from the community reaching enemy number one complaining, you see that there is something wrong in the water. You see there's something wrong in the water. There are so many issues coming out that it's a waste of time to mention all of them. But it's important for us, for us to know that there is a significant difference between holy and not holy. Holiness is what HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to tell us, what the Chachamim are going to tell us. What looks holy is not necessarily always holy. Dressed a certain way, singing a certain way, praising a certain way, doesn't make it holy. Torah is holy. Torah is holy. Torah Tosha tells us Lo telech Do not go about tailbearing among your people. Onkelo says don't eat a meal of winking among your people. What is this don't eat a meal with a this is a uh, figure of speech. Don't socialize with people that all they do is say Lashonara. Now, of course, the naysayers say, wait, Rabbi, didn't you just do that? No. When you're bringing up things for the sake of helping people, there's no deen of Lashonara. When you're bringing up a warning against dangerous people, there's no issues of Lashonara. When you are going against heretics, apikosim, there's no issue of Lashonara. And the Torah specifies who and what and where so much so that there are severe punishments severe punishments that we've discussed in the past and maybe even mentioned a little bit today that it's important for a person to know that there are severe punishments for all crimes some worse than others now you're gonna have some people say oh this is not good you should speak peace. Scholars bring a, a peace to the world. You're right. They bring peace to the world by telling the world the truth. Telling the world the truth of the Torah. The truth of the Torah says that if you have a speaker out there that tells people 
that uh, if you're afraid of God, it's better you become an atheist. There's a speaker out there, relatively popular, that actually said this in a public lecture at least once, recently. He's so against the fear of the Almighty that he created a new halacha, that if you are afraid of Hashem, it's better you become an atheist. Well, let's see, because this week's parasha says you have to be holy, you have to run away from idolatry, there's death penalty for things like that. So, when you tell people to become an atheist, that's a chilul Hashem. Now what's worse? Idolatry or chilul Hashem? The Midrash Rabbah, Parashat Achremot, in Siman 22, says, in section uh, 6, says, that Kadosh Baruch Hu has certain things that he is completely hates. Completely hates. Some of those things are pretty obvious. Idolatry, desecrating his name, immodesty, morality, and so on. And Amitra says, What is the meaning of that which is written? I ask two things of you. Do not withhold them from me before I die. Keep vanity and falseness far from me. Give me neither poverty nor wealth, but allot me my daily bread, lest I be sated and deny you, and say, Who is Hashem? And lest I become impoverished and steal and take the name of my God in vain. This is Proverbs chapter 30, verses 7 through 9. So here we see there's several things being mentioned. One is denying God. Denying God. And the Midrash says, which one of them is more severe? The first one or the second one? Meaning poverty, which may lead a person to steal and swear falsely. Or the second one, to have wealth, which may lead a person to deny God altogether. So, poverty, lead a person to steal, that is desecrating Hashem's name. And atheism, denying God, that's like idolatry. Kadosh Baruch Hu responds, poverty which can lead to swearing falsely is more severe. Why? Because we find that the Holy One, blessed is He, tolerated idolatry, but did not tolerate the desecration of His name. And from where do we know this? That He tolerated idolatry, but not the, to- the desecration of His name. Where it says, and you are house of Israel, thus said the Lord Hashem, let every man go serve his idols, since you do not want to listen to me. This is in Yechezkel, chapter 20, verse 39. And subsequently it's written, and do not profane my holy name any longer. With your gifts and with your idols. From here we see that a Kadosh Baruch Hu prefers idol worship over desecration of his name. Meaning to go and tell people, go be an atheist, even as a joke. Needless to say, if you're serious, needless to say, if you're saying go be an atheist, if you instead of being afraid of God, there's no greater desecration of Hashem than that. It just doesn't get worse than that. But this is acceptable behavior today. Why? Because no one likes to speak out. The Torah Dusha, the Torah Dusha tells us to run away from such speakers. Torah Dusha tells us that you have to maintain a certain level of sanctity in your lives in order to connect to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And in this week's parasha, chapter 19, verse 12, it says, You shall not swear falsely by my name, thereby desecrating the name of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. I am your God. 
Then after that it says, you shall not cheat your fellow and you shall not rob. Here we're talking about honesty in business. Connecting the two, meaning that when a person is dishonest in his business, he is in a corrupt business, he cheats his customers, he doesn't pay his workers wage on time, he buys a bunch of goods knowing that he can't pay for them. That is desecrating HaKadosh Baruch Hu's name. You shall not curse the deaf. You shall not place a stumbling block before blind. You shall fear God. I am Hashem. Here we have multiple mitzvot. The Sefer HaChinuch has an entire write-up on each and every single one of them. Not cursing the deaf, what difference does it make? If he's deaf, he can't hear you. Rashi says, cursing the deaf is not cursing literally somebody that's deaf, but rather cursing somebody or speaking against them when he can't hear you. He's not there, speaking behind his back. He shall not place a stumbling block before the blind. Who puts stumbling blocks in front of uh, blind people? Were they uh, sick? No, it's not really referring to a blind person. Somebody that's spiritual, spiritually blind. You call him a tzaddik, even though he's a mechalel shabbat. You call her a tzaddika just because she gives staka, even though she doesn't know how to wear clothes that cover her entire body. You tell people that everybody's going to heaven and that God will apologize to them for putting them in the exile and all types of other mumbo-jumbo that does not belong in the Torah. These are putting stumbling blocks in front of people. When you tell people that everyone's going to go to heaven, when you tell people that the number one most important thing for them to do is to give tzedakah and not to learn Torah, not to fulfill the entire Torah and the mitzvot, when you don't rebuke them for after you see them doing things that are wrong repeatedly, when you tell them things that are against the Torah, that's putting a stumbling block in front of people. And what about fearing God? This is one of over 80 different places in the Torah. Over 80 different places in the Torah where HaKadosh Baruch commands us to fear Him. So how can you say fearing God is bad if HaKadosh Baruch says you shall fear God? Do you know more than God? God says you shall fear God. I am Hashem. But the speakers today say, no, 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 you're not supposed to be fear. not supposed to be uh, afraid of Hashem. You're not supposed to be afraid of Hashem. Why? No, you're supposed to love Hashem. You're supposed to love Hashem. Okay. You're supposed to love Hashem. You're supposed to love Hashem. That's why not fear of Hashem. They think that one cancels out the other. Torah says that you have to make sure not to pervert justice, not favor the poor, and uh, in, in, in justice, meaning that if you see that uh, a poor man is being sued by a rich man, and the poor man owes the rich man money, legitimately, don't just, and the rich man doesn't need the money, he has a hundred billion dollars. The poor man owes him a thousand bucks. And as legitimate proof, he owes him the money. You think, ah, the billionaire doesn't need the money anyway. It's okay, pass, pass. No, not allowed. You have to bring a dean against him. He owes the money. Doesn't make a difference who he owes the money to, whether he's rich or he's poor. And for anyone that thinks this is an alacha that I'm making up, Shukhan Aruch. Shukhan Aruch, Chosh Mishpat, Siman, Tzadik, Zayn. And Tai Siman about the 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 halachot uh, of lending money first starts with Siman Aleph that talks about the mitzvah to uh, lend money to a poor person is even greater than uh, mitzvah tzedaka. First, you have to help the people that are within your family, then uh, poor people. But don't think that just poor people you have to also help a rich person if he's in need. Rich person lost his wallet. He's, everybody knows that he's rich, but right now he's as broke as a joke. Mitzvah to help him. In fact, the Shukran Aruch says, Mitzvah l'alvoto l'pisha'a u'le'anoto. Afwad b'darim u'le'atso etza'a u'genet lo. 
to also make him happy. Don't just think just because he's rich, but no, no. Mitzvah to help all these different people. So you see, oh, it's really nice. The whole issues of lending, really nice mitzvah, help poor people. Asul in Goshet this is Siman Bet. If you know that the person that owes you money doesn't have the money, not to go chase him down, hound him, pressure him. No permission to do that. In fact, you're not even allowed to go meet him up and say, hey, I just wanted to catch up with you. Don't even say hello. Why? You know he doesn't have. You know he doesn't have. But if, on the other hand, he has and he doesn't want to pay, he's a rasha. He's a rasha. In Siman, hey, it says, "Imba malve le bedin, le mashken la love o le fera mimeno, yesh la bedin la asot lo din, velo yamru ploni ani ve'en lo uploni ashir ve'en tzarich lo, ella en merachmim bedin." Shuchan Aruch Panskins, if the lender brings the borrower to the bedin to get the money from him because he doesn't want to pay him otherwise, and the bedin sees that the lender is rich the borrower is poor never say oh the one that lender is rich the borrower is poor let it go says there's no mercy when it comes to the dean not allowed to be merciful this is the dean this is it yeah but what happened of helping the poor it's a mitzvah yes it's a mitzvah to help the poor it's not a mitzvah to be stupid it's not a mitzvah to change the torah so there are times to be merciful there are times to know what the dean is in fact if a person has the money and he doesn't want to return it siman tetvav says yes me show me she ain't shaliach bed din asur lekanes le beto le meshach no ela mishik no liot batok maonav there's a uh, some that say that um if to send a uh uh, to send somebody from the Bedin to go and collect the money, some say it's uh, don't do it. But if you know for sure that the person has the money, let's say he owes money to the uh, guy and he doesn't have the money in cash, but let's say he has on a painting, he has a book that he got as an inheritance, uh, let's say the Rambam's original book, worth a fortune. He has the money, but it's in stuff, but he doesn't want to return it. Why? Oh, it's it's sentimental to me. What does the halacha say? The bedding goes to his house, asks him for the stuff. He doesn't want to bring it. They arrest him and they beat him up until he either gives the money that he owes or he dies. Whichever one happens first. What happened to the being nice, mitzvah, take care of the, the, the poor, take care of the rich, take care of the family? Yeah, there's a mitzvah to help. But there's not a mitzvah that changed the law. And allow the people to be wicked. This is where fear of the Almighty comes in. When a person has fear of the Almighty, he's not going to get to a point of needing to be beat up, not by people and obviously not by Hashem, in order to fulfill the law. But when you tell people everyone goes to heaven no matter what, you are enabling people to become bigger criminals than they already are you are actually supporting their pre-existing crimes you are telling them they have nothing to be afraid of because if you're not afraid of god who are you going to be afraid of you are creating idolatry inside people's mind and calling it being religious you are literally destroying a torah in every way shape or form now what about the chachamim they talked about fear of the Almighty. There's no end to it. Rabbi Udaftaya, Allah Shalom, one of the tzaddikim over the last hundred years that saw the other side, spoke to the other side. And in his Minchat Yehuda, Parashat Kitavo, he talks about the fear of punishment versus the awe of Hashem. 
And he says there are two types of fear, namely the fear of punishment, which is when one fears God and behaves correctly so as not to get sick, impoverished, that his children should live. It follows that were he certain that nothing bad could happen to him, he would not serve God at all. So the first type of fear God is a person that's afraid of losing money, a person that's afraid of getting hurt. This is the lowest fear that the Rambam calls is the fear of children and women, not because it's bad. It's a foundational belief that all people have to have. But if it stays there permanently, it's not good. Why? Because there's a person that's not really serving Hashem fully because if Hashem would tell him, listen, you're not going to get punished. Or better yet, if somebody convinces him through all types of videos and lectures, there's no punishment. How can you burn the soul? What happens? All of a sudden, that person stops serving God. Why? Because in the beginning, he was only afraid of getting punished. The second you told him there's no punishment, that's it. He becomes secular immediately. Therefore, a person has to continue learning, continue connecting to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and serve even higher, more than just fear of punishment itself, of the majesty itself. And that's where the Rabbi Yudavtai continues. However, there's fear of the sublime. He calls this true fear, where... This is fear, fear of, the, uh, of the excellence of Hashem, which one is in awe of God because He is a master and ruler, the foundation, the rule of all the worlds. And when a person does his creator's will due to his greatness, whether it's advantageous to him or not, this is true fear. If a person had neither fear of punishment nor fear of the sublime and strays decadently after his heart, then God will have, will have to impose suffering on him so that he will at least fear the punishment. So here we have a little secret from the other side where Rabbi Yudavtai tells us, by the way, you see people suffering, that's because they didn't fear God. Not only they didn't fear God, like they said, they feared the majesty. not only that, HaKadosh Baruch is trying to Help them out. Not necessarily all people. Sometimes the Kadosh Bukhu gives suffering to per- people to elevate them. But many times, the majority of people, you see them suffering because the Kadosh Bukhu is trying to instill fear in them. Why? Because they're not only not afraid of His majesty, of His glory, of the, of the fact that he's, he's, he's everything, as the Chovot HaLevavot says, that the first step is for a person to understand how great God is in order to identify how small they are. The greater God is, the smaller you are. When a person doesn't have any fear of, the, of, of his majesty, then HaKadosh Baruch Hu has to make sure that he has at least fear of getting punished. And if he doesn't have that, then HaKadosh Baruch Hu breaks suffering on his life. All of a sudden, the car doesn't work. All of a sudden, the credit card doesn't work. All of a sudden, the, the door doesn't work. All of a sudden, nothing works. Instead of asking, why is God doing this to me? You're saying, what should I do to fix this? What mitzvah is the first mitzvah that I can do right now to get things going? To get things going. So of course, Chachamim discuss the issues of fear of the Almighty on a regular basis. Needless to say, it is important to study the subject and understand the how important it is to have fear of the Almighty. But when a person does not have that, does not have that basic fear, he could literally become a murderer. In two seconds. How so? The Torah Kedusha tells us in this week's parasha the issues of Kedusha. The issues of Kedusha. Where a person is not allowed to touch his wife if she's Nida. It's Isu Karet. A person is not allowed to be with a woman that he's not married to. Needless to say, she's not allowed to be with a man she's not married to. And even if they're married, they're only allowed to be together after she goes to the mikveh. And she's only allowed to go to the mikveh after she followed the steps of Tarat Mishpacha, family purity. To be together without following the laws of the Torah is death penalty. It doesn't get worse than that. 
It's genom. It's, it's, it's horrible. It's isur karet. Now, further the Torah says, this is obvious, but it's also obvious to, you're not allowed to be with your sister. You're not allowed to be with your mother. You're not allowed to be with your father. You're not allowed to be with your child. You're not allowed to be with your grandmother. You're not allowed to be with your father's second wife. You're not allowed to be with your mother's second husband. You're not allowed to be homosexual. You're not allowed to commit bestiality. But he's saying, these are all obvious. This is human nature. Why, why, why is the Torah mentioning it? And not only mentioning it, mentioning it multiple times. And in this case, week after week. And there's more places in the Torah that talks about it. It's not the only place. The issues of morality are mentioned countless times in the Torah. And things that you would think are common sense. Why does the Torah have to repeat it? Okay, let's see, you have to mention it once that a guy is not allowed to be with his mother. Fine. Now to be with his sister, you have to mention it once. No problem. Why do you have to repeat it again and again and again? It's common sense. The same reason why Kadosh Bukhu has to mention that you're not allowed to be with the woman that's not your wife. You're not to have boyfriend, girlfriend. Not to be with your wife if she's Nida. That's supposed to be common sense. But for a lot of people, it's not common sense. For the same reason that Kadosh Bukhu has to repeat that, he has to repeat the other ones. Why? Because not following any of those laws all begins with the lack of Yirat Shemaim, lack of fear of the Almighty. And when a person is not afraid of a Kadosh Baruch Hu, it only gets worse. Rabbi Udaftaya says in chapter 74 of Minchat Yehuda, why does the Torah not allow a man to remarry his ex-wife if she was married to somebody else. If they got divorced and she didn't marry anybody else and they want to get back together, if he's not a Kohen, allowed. But if she was with somebody else, not allowed to go back together. What's the difference? Comes up you with Haftaya. And he says, if the Torah allowed people to divorce their wives, remarry somebody else, divorce again, and come back to each other, people will turn it into a business. The poor man will say to his wife, listen, I can't support you, but I love you. Why don't you go with Steve down the street? He's got an eye for you. And we'll get a few dollars from Steve. He'll pay us generously. He's willing. I already talked to him. And then, two years from now, six months from now, two months from now, you come back to me. Wicked people will turn it into a business. And Rabbi Udaftaya says a chidush. Such a mentality will fill the earth with licentiousness and it could even lead to murder the question is how did you go from people following girls and boys and their lust to murder i mean that's pretty far according to logic but it's not avram avinu says to avimelech when avimelech asks him how come you didn't tell me that sarah is your wife why do you say she's my sister? Avraham Avinu says, I, say, I saw that there's no fear of Hashem in this place. And they will kill me over my wife. From there, Chachamim say in the Gemara, we learn, if there's no fear of Hashem, that person is always a potential murderer. Why? If he's not afraid of Hashem, that means that he believes he himself runs the world and nothing will stop him from murdering you if he sees the need so we see here Rabotai, that fear of the almighty is not only something necessary but it's actually the one thing that distinguishes a decent human being with a murderer 
to advocate not to be afraid of Hashem is to try to promote murder in society and everything else that comes along with it. Rabbi Eliyahu Lepian writes in Lev Eliyahu, in volume 2, this is quoted in, from a sefer called Zot Priti, in chapter 4, that the first aspect of Abu Dat Hashem, in which one must invest efforts in his youth is Kedusha, meaning protecting his Brit, and being moral, and not looking in the wrong places, and not touching the wrong places, even if that place is himself. For this is the foundation of the entire Torah, says Rabbi Eliyahu The degree to which one advances in his level of Kedusha is in proportion to the degree that he avoids satisfying his physical passions. As Chazal teaches us, that the eyes and the heart are the two intermediaries of sin. This is in Yerushalmi, Masech Brachot, chapter 1, Allah 5. And once a Talmud asked Rabbi Eliyahu for permission to attend his cousin's wedding. Rabbi Eliyahu heard him say that this wedding is in a different city. Initially, he was reluctant to answer him, but when he, the, press, the, the student pressured him, Rabbi Eliyahu says, the city is well known for immodesty. It's no place for a ben Torah. So the Talmud says to the Rav, Yeah, but Rabbi, I work very hard on guarding my eyes and thoughts. I'm not going to be affected by that place. I learned Torah all day. It doesn't matter that it's Tel Aviv. It doesn't matter that it's New York City. It doesn't matter that it's San Francisco. It doesn't affect me. I learn Torah all the time. What's the problem? It's just a wedding. It's my cousin. He's a tzaddik. Comes Rabbi Eliyahu to his student and says, in that case, you should go and see a doctor because obviously you're not feeling well. I'm already past 90 years old and blind in one eye. And I know that such sights would affect me. And you are so sure that it won't affect you. The fear of the Almighty was inside his bones. But he also knew human nature. There is no such thing as it's not going to affect me. There is no such thing as I can deal without being afraid of sinning, without being afraid of punishment. There is no such reality as far as achieving holiness without fear of the Almighty, without aspiring to be the holiest you could possibly be when it comes to the issues of morality. There are people out there that mistakenly think, says the author of the book, that there's nothing wrong with thinking immoral thoughts as long as their thoughts don't lead to action. And this misconception was already dealt with centuries ago by Rabbi Cheske Landau, the author of Nodabe Yehuda, who said, one should not say, all I'm doing is thinking about something, and surely Hashem will not count the thought as he would an action. This is not so. For an instance, for in this instance, the thought is the action. For it is such thoughts that lead to wasting seed. So much so that Rabbi Chaim Ivolozhin writes that a person that brings filthy thoughts to his mind is making a bigger desecration of a Kadosh Baruch Hu's name than even Titus did when he brought two prostitutes inside the Kodesh Kodeshim and made the act on a Sefer Torah inside the Kodesh Kodeshim. When a person thinks of somebody else's wife or some strange woman in his mind as a result of the films that he's watching, as a result of the films she's watching. You bring that garbage into your head as a result of your actions, that is a bigger desecration of a Baruch Hu's name. 
then the action of Titus, actually committing the act with two prostitutes inside the Kodesh Kodeshim. Why? A Jew has a completely different standard in the eyes of a Kadosh Baruch Hu than everyone else in the world. Because the Jewish mind, that's a Kadosh Baruch Hu sanctuary. That's the place between you and him. That's your intimacy with a Kadosh Baruch Hu. Nobody else knows what's in your mind other than you and a Kadosh Baruch Hu. Which means when you bring some prostitute into your mind, only a Kadosh Baruch Hu knows that. And thereby, it is the worst of the worst. Without fear of the Almighty, of desecrating His majesty, of desecrating His name, and if that's not where you're at, of guaranteeing that you'll get punished in this world and the next, without being afraid of that, what's to stop you? from being a potty mouth and mentioning all type of filthy words on the internet, posting all types of immodest pictures everywhere you can, your profile picture, your YouTube for videos, doing things that honestly you don't even see normal people doing. What's to stop you from literally being a disgrace to humanity if you don't have fear of the Almighty? The issues of Kedusha are so significant in the eyes of a Kadosh Baruch Hu that when a person is not careful, is not careful, they easily fall. Now, for those that say, yeah, but it's scary, why can't it be less scary? The very same Sefer, Zod Briti, brought many letters from the Stipe Lagaon. And one of the letters, the Stipe Lagaon, discusses this to help different Bachurim and Rabbanim and so on with this issue. Stipe Lagaon was the Rav, Chaim, Rav Chaim Kanievsky's father, he was the Gdolado. In page 107-108 in Zod Briti, they bring the Stipe Gaon, his, uh, his letters, called Karyana Igrata, number 14, where he says that when one is seized by the Yetzara, says the Stipler, he doesn't remember the Yetzara Tov. When the Yetzara, the Malach Hamavet, the Satan, all the same thing the Gemara says, Attacks him, some girl, some guy, some whatever, show, commercial, yet so it comes. All of a sudden he forgets that he's a Froom Jew. All of a sudden she forgets she's a married woman. All of a, all of a sudden they forget that the food's supposed to be kosher. All of a sudden they forget. Yet so it comes full force, they forget about the Yetzirah Tov, they forget everything. However, the fear of punishment can hold a person back from sinning, even in the heat of passion. Because even an Amaaretz, an ignoramus, is very scared of great suffering and pain. And when one has established in his heart that he'll suffer a terrible and bitter punishment for the sin, in both worlds, this world and the next, and perhaps he'll have to be reincarnated. This could serve to calm his passion. Says the Stipe Gaon in his Kedusha, knowing about the details of the suffering that the wicked get is of critical importance to deal with the Yetzirah. Why? Because sometimes... You're not learning Torah. Sometimes you're not exactly in the best place. Sometimes the Yetzirah comes to you out of left field. And all of a sudden you forget all the Torah that you knew. All the things that made you feel like you are a special holy person. 
Stiper the Gaon says, only thing is going to save you then from cheating on your wife, from cheating on your husband, from wasting seed and cheating on Hashem, from destroying your mind for a long period of time until you have the merit to, for HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to put that filth in the, so far back of your mind that you watched over two minutes show. You have to have merit for HaKadosh Baruch Hu to put it in the back of your mind. To earn that merit requires an enormous amount of Torah. It's not, oh, I stopped wasting seed six months ago, but I still think about it. I still dream about it. What do you think? It's going to go away? What do you think? It's gas? That stuff doesn't go away. Not easily. You have to bury it behind a lot of Torah. And until then, says the Stipe Lagaon, you have to know the details of what's going to happen to the wicked that do what you're thinking of doing. Because that good, all the reward and the sanctity and the beauty and all the wonderful things, loving Hashem, it's not going to help you deal with the Yetzirah. It's not going to help you deal with the Yetzirah. Your love of Hashem is not going to stop you from sinning. You need to know the details of punishment. Thereby meaning that regardless of whether you are a new Baal Tshuva, from from birth, a big rabbi as great as the Stipe Lagaon, or a zero like me, you have to have the minimum requirement of fear punishment in hopes that you'll go even higher and have fear of the Almighty and His Majesty, in hopes that you'll have the merit to maybe even love a Kadosh Baruch Hu. But there is no such thing as skipping the foundation. That foundation of fear and punishment is it everywhere. Same thing that Rabbi Nachman Breslov says in Likutei Maharan. Same thing, same thing everybody says. And the way to develop fear of the Almighty is by learning Musar, learning the will of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, learning an enormous amount of Torah, but not just Torah that talks about things that are not relevant to you, rather learning Torah that is relevant to you. A lot of people like to learn Torah that they could call nice Torah. Why? It doesn't obligate them to do anything. They like to learn the laws of the Kwanim. They're not even a coin. They like to learn the uh, different uh, laws of what happened in the Bet Mikdash. They like to learn, you know, the laws of things that are not necessarily relevant to them. Why? It's nice to learn about stuff like that. Or he likes to learn the laws of Lashon Hara. So what does he do? He's like, listen, we have a campaign. We don't speak any more Lashon Hara in our house. Oh, wow, Chazak Baruch. So you have Sefer, uh, the, the Chafetz Chaim in your house? No, 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 we don't need the uh, Chafetz Chaim in our house. Wait, did you read the whole book? No, no, we just, we got the point what Chafetz Chaim said, no Lashon Hara. So our whole house, we don't speak Lashon Hara. So you didn't read the uh, Chafetz Chaim. You don't even have it in your house, but you've decided that simply you're not going to speak any more Lashon Hara. Yeah. Okay, but I need to borrow the Chafetz Chaim. Where can I get it? Oh, upstairs, they speak a lot of Lashon Hara, so they have the Chafetz Chaim over there. People are delusional. Delusional, they think that they can just do things with skipping the Torah. The Mishnah in Avot says, in the name of Shimon HaTzadik, There are three things that hold the world. Torah, Avodah, and Gminut Chasadim. The Torah, the service of Hashem, and acts of kindness. Arav Avadi Alav Shalom in his Sefer, Anaf Etz Avot. He writes, why is it disorder, Torah, Avodat Hashem, then Chesed says from here we learn the Torah, the significance of the Torah exceeds the significance and value of bringing sacrifices to Bet HaMikdash 
as well as chesed. Many people tell you, oh, if you do chesed, that's the most important thing. No, not necessarily. No. Learning Torah is more important. Yeah, but if I give a lot of staka, that's it's good you give staka. But if you learn Torah, it's better. If you learn Torah, it's better. And our Vadya, Baruch Hashem, has endless sources over here. Brings Masechet Shabbat. Brings uh, Masechet Psachim. Masechet Nedarim. Brings the Psukim from the Tanakh. You know, Jeremiah. Many, many different sources. Baruch Hashem. Showing how Kadosh Baruch Hu says, Did I ask you, do I need your kobano? Do I need your sacrifices? Or do I need you to listen to me? Meaning, do I need you to listen to the Torah? And many other sources showing that Torah is priority. It's number one over everything. Learning Torah is over everything. Unfortunately, when a person does not learn a, a Torah, he's not going to know this. But he tells, no, no, I learned Tanya. But you realize that Tanya learned Torah. He didn't just learn Tanya. And the Tanya says in chapter 8 that all of those waste of time conversations, all of those potty mouth comments on the internet, all of that filthy, disgusting behavior, that's all kafakela. Because you don't even have the merit to go to Gainom. Go to Likutema Amarim in chapter 8. It gives you details of all of the people that are going to go to Kafakela. And for the people that think that they could just learn Tanya, or they could just learn Likutema Aran, or they could just learn one book for the rest of their life. And they don't have to learn Chumash, they don't have to learn Gemara, they don't have to learn Alakha, they could just wing it. The Baal Tanya in the Kutah Marim says in uh, Lamed Bet, this is actually uh, Amud Lamed Bet, it's in chapter 25, chapter 25, chapter uh, uh, Hafei. He says that the union is eternal in the upper spheres for he's uh, for blessed is he however here below the uh, uh the union is within the limits of time persisting only during such time when one is occupied in the study of torah in the or in a performance of a commandment for afterward if he engages in anything else he is here below separated from the higher unity this is so when he occupies himself with, with altogether vain things which are utterly useless for the divine service. Nevertheless, should he later repent and return to the service of God, to Torah and prayer and ask for forgiveness of God for not having engaged in the Torah when he could have, God will pardon him. And to quote the sages, if one has transgressed against the positive precept, but as repented, he's pardoned on the spot. And therefore, they instituted the blessing of forgive us in the Amidah three times a day for the sin of neglecting the Torah, a sin which no one can escape each day. Similarly, the daily burnt offering used to bring atonement for neglect of a positive precept. This is not the same as saying, I will sin and repent afterwards. Unless the time he is committing the sin, he relies on subsequent repentance and sins because of it, as explained elsewhere. So the Baal Tanya says, everyone is obligated to learn Torah. When you learn Torah, you have an extraordinary protection and a unity with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. When you're not learning Torah, you do not have this unity with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. You do not have this special protection unless you're involved in a mitzvah. But if you are not only not learning Torah, and you're not only you're not involved in a mitzvah, but you're actually involved in vain things. You are drinking, you are smoking, you are talking about sports, you're dancing in the middle of the street. You're doing all types of nonsense that has nothing to do with Torah. Not only you don't have the protection from a Kadosh Baruch Hu, but you have sins of Bitul Torah. And for that, a person has to either do tshuva or know that he's going to get punished for it. And hence the reason... Why the Balatanya says, Bitul Torah, not studying enough Torah, that's a sin all of us commit. But if you're doing it on purpose, meaning on a regular basis, you have a very much bigger problem. But if you're doing it here and there, you're messing up here and there, 
Oh, for that, the Chachamim already thought about you. That's why in our Amidah prayer three times a day, we say, I'm sorry, Dagadosh Baruch for not learning enough Torah. So here we see the Baal Tanya. Doesn't say just learn Tanya. It says learning Tad Torah. And needless to say, it says Torah is priority. Same as Ravadya. Ravadya says, you have endless sources across the Torah. It talks about how the Torah is superior to Chesed, superior to prayer, superior to everything else. But I thought to myself, Besiyad Vishmaya, but why is it considered superior? It could be equal. Why superior? Perhaps it's because when you're talking about servitude of Hashem as far as bringing the sacrifices, sacrifice is a way to get a do-over, a do-over from Hashem. I messed up, brought a sacrifice. It's a way to sanctify Hashem's name. Different type of sacrifice, but nonetheless. So either you get a do-over, or you sanctify Hashem's name, you thank Him. On the other hand, the chesed creates peace, creates unity, you help somebody out, unites you, you're now friends, shows that you're part of the same nation, part of the same family. But Torah, Torah does all of that. You see, when you learn Torah, not only is that learning Torah, learning the word of HaKadosh Baruch Hu himself, and therefore sanctifying his name, but on top of that, learning Torah is going to teach you how to do over, how to fix, and actually inspire you to do over, inspire you to do tshuva. And even more so, it'll create unity because you study with a partner, you study with a chavuta, and maybe you'll have the merit to also teach people one day and thereby create unity and peace. Because Talmidei Chachamim, Marbim Shalom Ba'olam. Because Talmidei Chachamim, they bring peace to the world. But peace by telling people what the Torah says, not what some Joe Shmo said or what you think he said, or what you thought he said. But what Torah says? The Torah says, Kedoshim to you. Kedoshani. You be holy, because I am holy. With that being said, I'm going to have a little bit of a drink. Is that the shame? And you guys can ask some questions. Hopefully this was chizuk for me as it was, chizuk for you as it was for me, learning all of it. Baruch Hashem. Okay, first question says Jeremy, saying Kaddish for grandparent, anything bad or Ainala for a living parent? No, saying Kaddish is a way to sanctify Kadosh Baruch Hu's name. It gadal vit Kadesh These are ways of uh, uh, honoring a Kadosh Baruch Hu's name. It has nothing to do with Ainala. No. Kadosh. Kadosh means holy. Okay, are amulets kosher? Because I know of a rabbi in Israel who writes amulets on parchment for chesed. He does not charge. I do believe he wants to help others. He has amulets for healing. Parnasa, fertility, ainara. Is this allowed and does it work? Uh, if it's a uh, real amulet that uh, that's a, uh, follows a specific regiment of... Uh, of uh, uh, through that, throughout all of the generations, meaning if he has, let's say, the Masoret of Rav Kaduli that brought it from previous generations and so on, then yes, a uh, a uh, amulet uh, or what we call a um, uh, a kamea uh, can uh, can do a lot of good things, uh, but uh, you know, it's a it's you have to make sure that it's real because there's a lot of scammers. 
in the uh, in that particular business and one of the ways uh, that you have to uh, you know see whether it's a good or not is uh number one like you said if he charges money for an amulet then uh you know it's already a problem uh if they charge money for an amulet even rabbi daftaya rabbi daftaya himself uh made uh came out that dealt with very very serious stuff uh and you know he didn't charge anything so uh uh, it, it's the real Mekubalim don't charge, you know, for uh, for come out. And many times they won't even accept money. But nonetheless, if they charge money, Rabbi Yudavtai actually writes in his Uchot Mesaprot, uh, it's already a sign that it's fake. It's not a real come out. Uh, second thing is, is that uh, sometimes they'll pretend like they're not charging money, but then somehow somebody's going to ask you for tztaka and, you know, Karatatov, and they have this, and they have a kolel, and they have a Bet Midrash, and they have poor people, and before you know it, fifteen thousand dollars later, you got yourself uh, something you have no idea what to do with. So, the 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 second bigger sign even is uh, what do they uh, do with their day? Meaning, this rabbi, what does he do all day? If all day he's dealing with making kameot, run away from him. But if all day he's toiling in Torah, all day he's learning Torah, and once in a while he makes time for the tzibul to uh, to talk to them, and once in a blue he makes a kamea. Fine, but uh, if a person is making kameot, that's that's his whole thing. He deals with that all day. It's not a good sign at all. It's not a good sign at all. Now, as far as kameot in general, I, I have actually I, have, I know a person. It's Tomit Chacham is very serious people. Person he has actually the Masoret, He has the instruction said directly from Rav Kaduri. He doesn't deal with it on a regular basis. Only if I ask him for a very special favor does uh, does he do it because it takes an enormous amount of time. And Kavanaugh to do it, and he's, it's just simply one of those uh, things that uh, uh, it's, 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 it takes a life of its own. Uh, but either way, it's a, uh, you know, some of these things have very serious meaning, but many times people get come out for, uh, for things that, uh, let's just say, uh, they, uh, they don't need the come Let's just say they don't need the come Like, for example, somebody say getting a come for Panasa or somebody getting a Kamea uh, against, uh, you know, I don't know, protection from, I don't know, bad people. Fine, I mean, yeah, you can get things like that, but I mean, generally speaking, if you learn Torah, you do mitzvot, you, you give maser, there are other things that you can do with that doesn't require a Kamea. Typically, a Kamea, I can tell you one time that uh, we had to ask for a favor from somebody, for somebody, uh, this Mikubal that I know, I had to ask him for a favor to get it for somebody that I know because it was a problem what happened was a woman was uh, uh having a miscarriage she having miscarriage she had several miscarriages and she needed uh you know more than just what we were doing more than praying more than this. There was something that was happening somebody something was spiritually uh so this mikuba said yes there is a specific kamea and it has, it's not just like a, writing a little piece of paper it's you have to use this paper you have to laminate it you have to take one and uh, put it next to the person at all times. The other one, you have to put it on the belly. And, you know, it's a whole process. Uh, and an instructions that comes with it. There was another woman that had a uh, surgery uh, that uh, needed, uh, was very life-threatening surgery. So there are certain things that a person should go out of their way to the Mekubal and, and see who this person is, ensure that it's legit. Why do I, why, why to ensure that it's legit? What's the worst thing that could happen? Well, there are some people that recommend for people to use their mezuzah, their mezuzah as a kamea, or things like it. And the Rambam writes that if a person uses the mezuzah not in accordance to what it's supposed to, that's a very serious crime. You can get death penalty. And one of the Rabbanim, one of the Rabbanim, Talmud Chacham in Eretz Yisrael, very famous speaker, uh, he told a story himself. He told the story himself, horrific story, but he told the story himself that somebody told his father to take a mezuzah and uh, and put it under his pillow because he got sick and uh, they were worried that it's going to get any worse. So take the mezuzah and put it under his pillow. Literally, within two days, two days of him putting this mezuzah under his, uh, his uh, pillow, the situation got so severe he died 
something that was supposed to be minor at best okay maybe go visit a doctor a couple of times two days died they found out who what when and how found out this is what it was Rambam said don't use the mezuzah in such fashions but this mekupal not megubal the mekubal this this uh, this guy created a uh a sgula to put a mezuzah in a uh, under under a pillow who said you have permission to do such things so again you have to make sure that you don't believe anybody just because they say they're a rabbi or just because they say that they're a mekubal uh, it's a uh it's not uh it's not something to play with um if you know for sure that this person is a ish kodesh he's a very serious tamit chacham he has farim he has uh you know he's he's known for his torah knowledge not just for miracle work he knows for his torah knowledge and he knows to, that to, he's known to be someone that toils in torah then yeah yeah you could uh, get certain uh come out or amulets uh if you truly need it if you truly need it but don't start getting a uh a collection of cameos where some people make a whole business out of it you know there he has a little string on his arm he has a little uh eye he has a little this he has a little that before you know it he has 87 different things before he leaves the house he has to make sure that he kisses all the walls just to make sure that he followed uh you know uh, every uh every uh, uh craziness that he has no it's a there are certain things if you truly need it then yes if you have the access go for it but uh, to be honest with you a lot of stuff that's out there is scam a lot of stuff like for example this whole thing about red string red string on on people people think that it's going to protect them first of all i saw with my own eyes Rav Kanievsky saw a, sh- a red string on a person's hand and he says what is this so they sold it to me it, the the uh it's gonna, for protection he says whoever sold you that is crazy crazy people think that this red string is protection why would he call it crazy because that red string the source of it is idolatry it comes from india it doesn't come from judaism it doesn't come from judaism the only thing in judaism that has a red string on it just so you know the only thing that has a red string on it is the koban that we throw off the cliff to azazel on yom kippur that's the one thing that has a red string on it because that red string it's tied around the koban the person takes the there's two korbanot the coin gadol has one the hashem one lazazel to yetzara to leave us alone on yom kippur okay so the uh, the koban that goes to azazel they put a, a red string around him and they walk and walk and walk and walk him after they fed him the whole day they walk and walk and walk him and what uh, right off the cliff disaster strikes the worst most vicious fall out there horrific because that's the way the satan likes it and at the time of the bet mikdash especially the the first one uh they they saw that the other part of the string that the coin still had if it turned white from red then we knew that hashem forgave us but the other part that's red still that's the that's the uh that's the sheep that's off the cliff so unless you're a sheep and you want somebody to throw you off a cliff i'm not really sure why people are wearing this red string not really sure because it's either india the idol worshippers or it's the koban that goes to azazel usually people don't want to go to azazel you tell somebody Lech azazel in hebrew you're probably gonna get slapped no one wants to go to azazel so again but if you go to the kotel you go to the kivret sadikim you go to play you're always going to find somebody selling you one of these strings a purple string a red string red string is the most popular so you have to make sure that with this type of stuff especially the stuff that's in essence supernatural ultra ultra careful because if it's not legit if it's not legit it'll cause damage many times it causes damage damage that Hashem yishmo v'yatzil damage damage not like worse than what the blessing that a person wanted the person wanted shalom bite they got divorced person wanted good health died like horrible stuff you have to be careful with this stuff if you have all the all the things all the uh uh things are checked off everything is good how do it it's uh as i've said i've uh i've used it i have uh uh, uh a uh, uh people that have needed it at, at certain times but it's it's not something that i deal with but nonetheless it's a uh it's it's legit if it's legit it's legit but if it's not it's very dangerous if it's not it's very dangerous so that's that's the uh 
That's the warning that I tell people. Uh, next, uh, if one purchases a new apartment and is having many problems after moving into the new place, what one needs to do other than checking the mezuzot is burning sage or allowing to get rid or is burning sage and etc allowed to get rid of the negative energy is it considered Abu no no need to burn any sage uh if you have a new apartment first thing to do is to have a uh chanukah tabayit. what's chanukah tabayit? invite 10 kosher people to your house and have a shiur Torah. You have to have a Chanukah bite. This is something that's very important to sanctify the home. That's priority number one. You don't have Chanukah bite, then uh, you know it's 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 a problem. You have to have Chanukah bite. Now, if a person can't have Chanukah bite for whatever reason or another, they don't live next to kosher people or or something like that, or it's just let's say I don't know, it's uh, the the plague that we've had for the last couple of years. People are afraid to get out of their house. And you can't get somebody so you have to make sure that uh you study torah uh at least uh, uh you know uh, uh, hours at night study torah a lot of torah that's the second thing but also there has to be torah in that house every day a house that has torah in it every day has shalom a house that does not have torah in it the uh the gemara says will eventually get burned so that's that's the uh that's that's the the variance here you have Torah you'll have Shalom don't have Torah fire so it's a these are things now if you have Torah and you had the uh, Hanukkah Tabayit people learning Torah and you invited Chachamim to come to your house on a regular basis you had Shiur Torah once a week once every couple of weeks once a month at least you have people you have Chachamim coming to your house doing Shiur Torah in your house your husband's learning kids are learning all are good but still there's some issues still there's some issues check the mezuzot check the mezuzot people would like to default on making the mezuzah the problem because that is the uh, 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 easiest thing to do check a mezuzah buy another one solve all your problems for a few hundred dollars it's usually it's not the mezuzah it happens that sometimes it is the mezuzah and I've told you guys stories over the years where somebody had a uh, mezuzah problem and it created issues there's a very famous story from Rav Grossman who uh, uh his, his daughter had a uh, unique type of infection on her face that literally deformed her face deformed her face tried going to all the different doctors and nothing happened literally was there for, for years she suffered a lot over it eventually went to Lubavitcher Rebbe Allah went to Lubavitcher Lubavitch Rebbe Lubavitch Rebbe without even literally without a conversation showed him his daughter and uh he himself like blocked the Lubavitch Rebbe's way to tell him I'm here it's an emergency and he pointed at his daughter Lubavitch Rebbe told him in mezuzah immediately the Rav Grossman called his wife the mezuzah of his daughter's room was missing one of the letters that in the in the word I so the sec they fixed it they replaced the mezuzah literally that night she healed after years after years of 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 not uh of of of, of having this eye problem mamash ruach hakodesh ruach hakodesh but the Cherebi to, to, to do such a thing but needless to say that doesn't mean he's god doesn't mean he's mashiach it doesn't mean he's all the things that people say he is that's why it's sad there's so many great things that that he's done that idolizing him ruins everything idolizing him ruins everything the point being is yes there are issues that happen at times with a mezuzah from my experience typically it's not the mezuzah typically it's something else it's somebody's not learning Torah it's somebody's not modest it's somebody's not moral it's somebody's not acting right sometimes there's a uh, uh certain things that uh a person has done in their past they forgot about so uh there are different things it depends who the person is uh but if a person has already done everything check the mezuzah last but not least is you know not just checking the mezuzah because sometimes you're going to check the mezuzah and uh you'll see nothing and nothing is wrong it's a uh all the letters are there but it's not really a good quality mezuzah 
meaning that it's a mezuzah, it's kosher, but it's, you know, kosher. That's it. That's, that's as much as you can say about it. It's not meudar, you know, the, uh, the, the scribe that wrote it. A, uh, you know, that's, he's not a Talmud Chacham. He pretty much writes mezuzot all day. So a mezuzah from somebody that writes mezuzot all day is not an ideal mezuzah. It's not a, if a person, he may have nice writing. If he's writing mezuzot all day, it's usually not nice writing, but he may have nice writing. But if he's writing mezuzot all day, it's not a good mezuzah. It's, it could be kosher, but it's not meudal. Why is it not meudal? You want the person that wrote the mezuzah to be a Talmud Chacham. Meaning that he is learning Torah all day, or only once in a while, he, has, he makes time to write mezuzot. Only once in a while. This is why, for example, our mezuzot that we deal with only come from Tamidech Chachamim. But it's also the reason why it takes a really, really long time to finally get them. So typically when I order, I order, let's say, 100, and I get them pieces, 20 every few months, another 20, another 20. So pretty much I have an ongoing order at all times for mezuzot. Why? Because I know it's going to take a long time until they finally get it to me. I have one sofer, he writes one mezuzah a week. And that order to, 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 for a normal house in America, it could take two years <laughs> to, to, to put the mezuzot from him. But his mezuzot are the best. Why the best? He learns Torah non-stop. He's a mekuba, he's a dayan, he's a tzaddik, he's a kodesh kodashim. So, and especially he's poor. So that's the best. He uh, doesn't want anything, any favors. He learns, he knows it comes from Hashem. Baruch Hashem. So you have, you have tzaddikim and you want mezuzah from them. If a person bought a mezuzah from eBay, or he bought mezuzah from some Judaica store, spent 80 bucks on it, 60 bucks on it, uh, you know, you don't even have to check that mezuzah. <laughs> get a different mezuzah. If you can afford it, get a different mezuzah. But unfortunately, people have a difficult time. They see, they go on the website, they say, oh, $500 of mezuzah. Can I just get a $50 mezuzah? You can get whatever you want. Get no mezuzah for it. It's your house. You bought a half a million dollar house, but you're protecting it with 50 bucks, by all means. So again, a person needs to know that the mezuzah, it's not just about it being kosher. It has to be good quality. The more, the best you can. But again, some people, they don't care. If a person can't afford the best of the best, but they can afford something that's better quality than, than the dirt that some people sell out there, then by all means. So somebody did a uh, video I saw maybe, I don't know, a year ago, two years ago, where they did a study checking random mezuzot in the community. Random. People gave them mezuzot. They went, took them to a lab. 80% of the mezuzot were not even kosher. Literally, it was like a, like a disaster. A disaster. They had like a whole series. I think it was like three, four, five lectures. I didn't watch all of them. But I knew they had like three or five lectures or maybe more of checking mezuzot. Like literally, the statistics were horrific. How many mezuzot people have that are not even valid? The guy has a mezuzah and there's nothing in it. It's just a little plastic piece. Or he has something, but it's better off not to have something because uh, that mezuzah has a cross in it. Or, or there's letters missing. Or it's on a piece of paper instead of being on a... Uh, uh, you know, a um, clef, uh or it's just uh, not really good quality writing, or the letters are connected. There's a whole slew of issues when it comes to mezuzot. But, despite all of that, I would not personally recommend defaulting to checking the mezuzah as number one. The default would be the other things that I mentioned, which is Torah. Once a person learns Torah on a regular basis, that in itself brings protection to the house. Surely they need to have the good mezuzah and so on and so on, but Torah is protection 24 hours a day. So protection for the house, protection for the kids, protection for the wife, protection for the husband, protection for everybody. So if a person is doing all of that and they had Chanukah the bite and everything else, then check the mezuzah and, 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 and go from there. Bezat Hashem. Combination of all those things surely should uh, bring blessing to a person's life. Uh, question of an Ohio that works in the music industry. If I write a song for an artist, a singer, of course with clean words, and subsequently him or his team decide to put immodest women in the video clip for that song that I wrote, would I then be guilty if someone wastes seed because of watching that video, even if I had nothing to do with it? Um... No, not necessarily. I mean, you have a, a certain product, you're bringing them words as long as your words are not, in essence, enticing the, uh, the, the action itself where you could get aroused simply by reading the words. 
you know, they decide to use those words inappropriately or and, and attach other things to it, it's not necessarily your problem. Uh, I mean, generally speaking, the music business in general is, is full of immodesty, not just when it comes to lyrics. Staff uh, is, uh, is, is typically uh, not modest and not moral. Uh, colleagues and uh, the, uh, the the customers, uh, you know. So you have to be very careful in that business altogether. Uh, but nonetheless, it's uh, there's a limited amount of uh, uh, you know of concern you need to have for what people do with your words. If you did one thing and they, um, you know, manipulated to something else, it's not your problem. Uh, next, uh, when is it good to tell a Christian? atheist about the truth of Judaism can it cause anti-semitism uh, the best time to tell a Christian or an atheist about the truth of Judaism is the first time you have a chance meaning I have people that send me uh, emails and messages every day uh, and uh, I would say at least a few times a day uh, missionaries send me uh, emails and uh, depending on if you know if it's an organization or if it's somebody that I've heard from before or not but if it's like a new person that's a missionary uh, then I, I always respond to them with my uh, uh, the email that I've told you guys about that I have a uh, email that has a bunch of links that are uh, you know anti-missionary lectures and so on it's a uh, wake up uh, uh, dear New Testament believer, believing in uh, Jesus and the New Testament is 100% idol worship. And this is the reason. Da, 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 da. So I send them all this message. So uh, usually I do that you know, once a day, once every couple of days. I uh, send people that without ever reading their messages, without entertaining what they have to say. The second that I see you know, anything uh, relevant to Jesus or, or the New Testament... Uh, uh, you know, then uh, that that person gets that email, and but sometimes they actually just automatically get blocked. Depending, it depends on who the person is. It's a uh, if the person is, uh, um, you know, thinks that they're doing good, uh, reaching out. It's one thing, but if they're like a professional missionary, it's something else. So it depends. But generally speaking. You give them one chance, but that's it. You don't start making them a project. You don't take them on as a project. You simply send the information. Good luck with that. That's it. Finished. You know, some people make uh, socializing over the internet their life. You know, they uh, yeah, every day I have some people tell me, oh, I have a friend who is a missionary. I have a friend who is a, a, how do you have time for all these friends? Oh, no, it's on the internet. Why are you making friends on the internet? It's a, people have to understand. You have 24 hours in a day. You have to make a living. You have to, if, you have, if you're married, spend some time with the family, wife, kids, husband, whatever. And you have to learn Torah. There's really not much time for all this socializing that people do with the friend. He has a friend here, he has a friend there, a friend on the internet. I don't know how people have that much time. So the key is somebody sends you a message, they're a missionary. You should have the uh, letter. If you want to get it, just send me an email and I'll send you the letter. I've sent it to people in the past before. By default, you take copy the letter paste it to your email or to your message, send it, the end. That's the end of the discussion. There's no back and forth debate. There's no dialogue. The end. That's the end of the discussion. If they send you more stuff, block. Simple. There's no, oh, let me prove you that uh, this, let me prove you that. No dialogue. No dialogue. Don't waste your time. It's, it's, first of all, it's not going to work most of the time. And uh, it's going to take up a lot of your time. You have to spend your time uh, helping yourself, and after that, helping Jews, not uh, helping missionaries uh, abandon their uh, their missionizing. Typically, the ones that you can help are people that are looking for the truth, not people that are preaching. People that are preaching are typically not looking for the truth. It happened to me one time that a missionary came to me, and uh, I sent her this uh, uh, this uh, message. And Baruch Hashem, today she is only a few months away from completing her conversion uh, to Judaism. Baruch Hashem, her and her daughters. But, uh, you know, but this is rare. It's rare. It's not, not common. Sometimes I have people like this one clown that sent me a message today. He has a uh, long uh, hairdo. Looks like he just came out of some, uh, I don't know, some uh, poster. And uh, he wanted to tell me, breaking news over the Mashiach. person like that gets blocked automatically. They don't even get a second chance or even a first chance. Somebody sends me a message, wants to tell me about Mashiach, blocked. Why? That's a crazy person. 
it's a crazy person it's not anyone that tells you i want to tell you about mashiach block block why it's the person that needs to be instituted that's the person that needs to be instituted other people they want to preach whatever they believe you want to send them an email send an email atheist first chance you have send them one of the emails that we have uh one of the videos first chance you get their phone number i'm gonna send you a movie right now i actually had a uh, call this week i had to speak to somebody who was a uh, selling books and uh and uh, he talked to me about a few things and he's like listen do you uh i told him about the organization he told me oh do you deal with people with uh emuna and so on i said sure why he's like well he has i have a son who uh you know grew up around religious but uh, i don't know had some emuna issues and just decided to uh abandon everything he doesn't keep anything anymore i said does he speak english he goes yeah it's the language he speaks i'm like all right what's his phone number give me his phone number i sent him a message of my uh movie i haven't watched the movie i haven't watched the movie oh can he can, can he talk to you no no he doesn't talk to me talk to the movie watch the movie once he watched the movie then we'll become friends if he's not willing to watch the movie there's nothing i can do to help him why i've already discussed this point a million times a person needs to help themselves be willing to help themselves in order for you to be able to help them so you send people information that is the whole point of social networking social networking is not for you to socialize social networking is for you to share torah that's it not read people's messages not make friends share information go share leave like a sniper go share torah leave don't start looking at people's profiles and hey how you doing how's the wife how's the kids what do you do like that stuff is a waste of time people that do that a very very serious problem of bitul torah of yetzerah and a lot of other things so go share atheist uh agnostic uh whatever share information leave that's the way you gotta be you gotta be like a spiritual spammer but you're spamming them with something that's gonna save their life if they have merit and willpower they'll do tshuva they'll read the information they'll watch the lecture they'll do tshuva if they don't they don't you've done your job finished but uh you know there's a uh, certain amount of effort that's required from the person themselves you can't force people to do anything next does tikkun klali reading help from wasting seed for a noahide and does uh reading about uh, mana daily help uh, with uh, merits with parnasa uh no i don't i don't i've never seen anyone say that it does uh i've never seen anyone say that it does help the noahides uh, either way tikkun klali is not something that's going to help a person uh from wasting seed it's only going to help a person uh develop a desire to do tshuva meaning to learn about yirat shamayim learn more torah uh, it's supposed to in essence learn reading tikkun klali is supposed to uh be easier than learning torah and, and it's supposed to create a certain spark inside them to desire to do tshuva for for wasting seed it doesn't by itself fix wasting seed sins that a person already made and it does not uh stop them from doing it it's in essence supposed to spark up a person to do tshuva so it may help because reading the tikkun kali is tehilim and non-jews uh, uh noahides are perfectly allowed and should read tehilim so uh it could work for them i'm not sure i've never seen it as far as reading parashat mana where the hells with panasa again this is a sgula by uh, that has a long masoret uh that Am Yisrael reads parashat mana for for parnasa uh and it helps uh certain people so long as they don't do things to ruin it because a person can read parashat mana 50 times a day not once a day 50 times a day for a thousand years and it won't help him with parnasa if he's doing things to ruin his parnasa like wasting seed violating shabbat and so on so a person needs to be more concerned over not ruining his parnasa by going against the Torah once a person does all the things he's supposed to that in itself helps panasa but many times people ruin their panasa and that's why even the zgulot don't help them so I would suggest for everyone whether Noahide or Jew to make sure that first and foremost they have a check mark next to all the things they're supposed to do and a x mark next to all the things that they're not supposed to do once you have all of those that in itself should bring blessings to a person whether it's a zivug or it's panasa or it's all the other things but if a person is not helping themselves nothing in the world can help them uh next uh promised messiah elia 
your wedding has come to West Africa, Ghana. Uh, 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 since everything he does and says is Chilu Hashem, is it possible that Shmuli Boteach is a demon? Or does he have an evil soul? What's the purpose of his life? Uh, seems like he only cares about money and fame and uh, spread uh, perversion. Rabbi Yol Misatmil, Rabbi Yol Misatmil, I actually just learned this chidush in the last week. A friend of mine sent it to me, and I saw uh, Rav uh, Yaakov Shapiro bring Rabbi Yol Misatmil that uh, in Divrei Yoel, Parashat Vayekel, he says that uh, if a person befriends the Reshaim, he has friends that are wicked, he's friends with homosexuals, he's friends with Mechale Shabbat, he's friends with people from corrupt businesses. When he goes to sleep, let's say he keeps Torah, let's say he's even a rabbi, okay? He keeps the right, keeps mitzvot, but he's friends with all of these wicked people, not for the sake of doing kiruv. He likes them. Get staka from them, have a couple of beers with them, and so on. The, the punishment for being friends with wicked people is that when he goes to sleep, his neshama, like everybody else's neshama, goes up to shamayim. But he can get a punishment that his neshama will become disgusted from him, from the, what his body is doing, being friends with all these wicked people, these anti-God people, that it doesn't want to come down. So what does the Kadosh Baruch do? He gives them a dish, different neshama. And he can even give them a neshama of a non-Jew, a wicked person, instead of the neshama that he had. Further, the Magen Avraham, in the name of the Mekubalim, also uh, one of them is the, the Rashba, says that the reason... Why we say every day morning blessings. Baruch shelo asani goy. Baruch shelo asani shifra. Baruch shelo asani evid. And so on. Men, women. Nothing happened since yesterday. I wasn't a goy yesterday. Baruch Hashem. I'm not a goy tomorrow. What do I have to say? Shelo asani goy. Thank Hashem for no asani goy every day. Now for you non-Jews, don't be offended by this. It's not to offend anybody. But the reality is, every Jew is supposed to be happy that he's not a non-Jew. Why? Because the fact that he has the burden of Torah is the greatest burden of all burdens. It's the greatest gift of all gifts. It's called the burden of Torah because it's not something that's easy to do. But it's the greatest gift in the world. He has 613 mitzvot that he has to fulfill. Whatever one of them are relevant to him, whereas Noah Hyde has less. Same thing with a man versus a woman, a Jewish man, Jewish woman. He says, Thank you, Hashem, for not make me a woman. Why? Because I have more mitzvot. I have to learn Torah more than a woman does. Doesn't make me better than a woman. But I have a bigger responsibility, more Torah. She has an elevated spiritual status naturally that a man needs to work towards. So the point is, you bless Hashem for those things. But Rabbi Yahweh Misadma says, okay, but what about the Goy? Okay, I wasn't a, I wasn't a Goy yesterday. I wasn't a Goy today. Why don't I say thank you every day? He says, because the Ramak says that when a person goes to sleep, Neshama goes up to Shamayim. Neshama tells Hashem everything that this person did today. Shmuel Boteach just told everybody you don't have to keep all the mitzvot. Shmuli Boteach promoted homosexuality. Shmuli Boteach tells people that to go to his daughter's sex shop. Shmuli Boteach allows desecration of Hashem to run out of his mouth like it's a mitzvah. That neshama goes up to Shemaim. HaKadosh Baruch could put a non-Jewish neshama in him. And therefore, every time a person wakes up in the morning, a Jew wakes up in the morning and says, Thank you, Hashem, for not making me a goy, meaning that, Baruch Hashem, I didn't make sins to, to get that such a punishment that you would replace my neshama. Now, of course, if a person does tshuva, 
he can get his original neshama back but it's not so simple well it's same thing with the neshama of a woman a person says thank you Hashem, for not making me a woman why thank you Hashem? he didn't make me a woman yesterday because a person can get punished and get the neshama of a woman all of a sudden he's emotional yes his wife yesterday hey honey did you uh, make something to eat no oh he starts yelling at her gets mad at her starts cursing up a storm he goes to sleep neshama goes over to shamai hashem says give him a girl neshama give him a girl neshama girl neshama comes into his body the next day he wakes up in the morning looks at his wife hi honey she doesn't want to answer him why aren't you answering me he forgot what he did yesterday he forgot how he cursed her he slapped her a few times he forgot but all of a sudden he's emotional oh you don't love me he starts crying like a little baby <laughs> what happened you little girl why are you crying yesterday you were a vicious monster why are you crying like a little baby he goes to the office one of the guys in the office doesn't say hi to him he starts crying starts becoming emotional what happened what happened is because those gave you measure for measure measure for measure why you didn't do the right thing so a person can't get his neshama replaced can't get his neshama replaced Hashem Yishmo, and the worst part about it the worst part about it Rabotai Karim, in the name of the of, uh, of the Rashba he says that a person that's an apikolos like Shmuli Boteach a, small, a person that's an apikolos like the uh Manis that just published a uh a post of a new campaign God needs you that's his new that's his new series he calls it God needs you Hashem Yishmo a person like that says the Rashba that's an apikos and distorts the Torah is admitting that he is not from the Zera of Avraham Avinu but rather from the Zera of the Shedim that Adam Arishon created a person that goes against the Torah not accidental purposeful it means what is he saying he's saying Torah is not a myth my myth is better distorts it what is he saying the Rashba says he's saying that he is not from the seed of Avraham Avinu he is from the seed of the demons that Adam Arishon created when he separated from his wife for 130 years so my dear friend Chaim you are very very likely right in all aspects could very well be that him and the other apikosin have the neshamot of demons does that allow us to kill them no does that allow us to hurt them physically no does that allow us to even make fun of them for no reason no our enemies are people that are going against the Torah it's not a personal issue if they did tshuva tomorrow we'd be the first ones to say we don't hate them personally for their hairstyle or their uh, choice of food we have an issue with what they're doing as far as desecrating Hashem's name and misleading people so we never make fun of people personally like calling people names like ugly and this and that we try to stick to the Torah once in a while I get uh I, car- I get carried away but I try to stick it to the stick to the Torah so yes it's very possible that these wicked people uh could have the souls of uh, of demons could have the souls of wicked people but the goal is to understand that they still have the spark of a Jew they're still the child of a Kadosh Baruch Hu. Akadosh Baruch Hu still wants them to do tshuva and despite who it is in this generation needless to say if it's any of the people that I've met and any of the people that I've spoken against none of them none of them have done as much damage as Menashe did the son of Chizkiyahu he brought idols inside the Kodesh Kodeshim of the Beit HaMikdash he murdered Isaiah the prophet which was his grandfather every crime under the sun idolatry was standard 
But yet, HaKadosh Baruch Hu desired his tshuva, and when he did tshuva, HaKadosh Baruch Hu welcomed him with open arms. Why? The Baal tshuva is even greater than someone that has always been religious. Why? Because he knows the bad, and he still chose Hashem. So, we don't wish for people to do tshuva, for people to die. We wish for people to do tshuva. But if they don't want to do tshuva, it's better off for them to die. Why? Because at least they'll get punished a little less, because less sins. But the key is to understand is that the desire for us is always to pray for people to do tshuva. Pray for people to do tshuva. That's number one. But it is possible that they will have a much harder time to do tshuva if they've caused the masses to, to sin. It becomes much, much more difficult to do tshuva from there. Nearly impossible. The Rambam says, say, Hashem, uh, in essence, almost closes the door in their face if they cause the public to sin. And the reason why I say almost is because there is an actual Rambam that says that there are people that he does close the door. What is closing the door? Closing the door is HaKadosh Baruch Hu removes their desire to do tshuva. Like they don't even have what Menashe had, which was that nitzotz, that spark, that spark of desire to do tshuva, even that they don't have. Like, worst of the worst. Worst of the worst. We hope and pray that uh, no child of HaKadosh Baruch Hu is in that uh, is in that is, is that far? Why? Because Hakadosh Baruch Hu does not desire to burn his own child for eternity. He's not going to get any pleasure out of it. He's not going to be happy burning Manus Freeman and Ephraim Goldberg and uh, and, and the rest of the Rishayim. He's not going to be happy about that. Hakadosh Baruch Hu cries over those people every day. Hakadosh Baruch Hu cries over those people and all the people that they. Take with them to gain all. He cries over those people every single day. So we are not here to dance around their grave. We're hoping that they and their friends will do tshuva. Until they do, we'll fight against their heresy tooth and nail. With all of the strength that we need and have. There's other shame. But the ultimate reminder is that we desire the day. And all of their followers will do real tshuva and connect to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. All of them will do tshuva and connect to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Because they still are children of HaKadosh Baruch Hu and he does not want to destroy them. He will have to if they don't do tshuva. He will destroy them if he don't do tshuva. But so long as they're alive, that means that they still have a chance. Next, my aunt's brother passed away right before Pesach. Shem the family is secular. I called one distant cousin to stop the cremation. She told me it was too late, but our family wouldn't change their mind anyway. She said, I'm crossing my boundaries, getting involved, and this is my opinion. I explained the Jewish law. She said it's their decision. How can I respond to somebody who does not understand and respond like this? I believe out of ignorance. Um... You respond by not talking about the whole cremation altogether. Rather by trying to get this person to identify who God is. Who created the world. Now they're not going to be able to. So you send him a lecture. Send him a Hashem took back his millions lecture. Send him signature of God lecture. Torah, science and the uh, wisdom of the sages lecture. Movies. Send it to them. If they live close enough to you, invite them to your house to watch it with you. Pretend like it's the first time you're ever watching it. Let them know that there is a God. And God gave us a Torah. Once they know that God gave us a Torah, then you can start working up the ladder that you have to keep Shabbat and keep this and keep that and the other thing. But to go and uh, convince somebody that's completely... Torahless, completely spiritually broke, that them burning a body is wrong, it won't make sense to them. Why? Why is it wrong? Why is it wrong? God said it, 
God said a lot of things that I don't listen to. Why is it wrong? Who said God said it? Prove to me that God said it, and it's not the time. So you're, you're going to the end goal on day one. You can't. There's a process. First thing for everybody across the board is to realize that there's a God, and God gave us a Torah. That's the first step with everybody. Teaching a person specifics of mitzvot that have to do with their emotions that force them to change certain things is not the way to start it why because in essence again you're thinking about oh it's wrong he's gonna suffer yes he's gonna suffer and there's nothing you can do about it and don't worry akadosh Baruch knows he's gonna suffer and akadosh Baruch is the one that allows it to happen why because he lived his life that way there's a deen in shemaim there's a deen in shemaim that decides the dine kibuta kevel in the movie Chibut Akeva, we discussed it. In the lecture about Chibut Akeva, we discussed it. There are certain things that are decided in Shemaim. One of them is how a person is going to be buried. How much they're going to suffer. If a person lived against God his whole life, he can get a deen that's the worst of the worst, which is pretty much not get buried. Never have any peace. Meaning that person that is getting burned, if that, and, and he's going to be sitting in some little canister, he's going to be a little Coca-Cola bottle, it's going to be in somebody's uh somebody's counter somebody's uh shelf it's going to have his ashes that person will never stop suffering he will never even go to gain he'll be in kafakela for eternity until he gets buried why because person has to get buried in order to even have the merit to even go to gain but the point is that he wrote his own check he lived his own life there's no feeling bad for him there's no feeling bad for him All right he did it to himself his blood is in his hands we feel bad for people that are alive and are going against God why because we could do something about it somebody had died he died now you want to do something for him want to help him by all means you could do it but it's not a uh to, to 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 start off that way is not the right approach it's not the right approach you have to start off by trying to help the people that are alive focus on the people that are alive not the people that died people that died there's very hard to help them possible but very hard very hard to help them tell you a story one of these stories that uh, if it wasn't told in such this fashion it'd be impossible to believe Rav Yosef Chaim Sonnenfeld he Told the story to his a uh, in his yeshiva. He said there was a couple in uh, Holland, Ashkenazi Kila over there, that uh, had a uh, silver business, selling all types of uh, stuff. You know the netiyatidaim, the this, all of the silver products, things for the candelabras, and Baruch Hashem, they were doing well, doing well, made some money. And the wife got this thing in her head that uh, she feels bad that there are certain people that are dying and uh, they don't have any kids to say Kaddish over them, either because they didn't have any kids or because the kids are not religious. And she went to her husband and said, my dear husband, we should do chesed for the metim, for all the people that died. We should give our ma'asel for the yeshiva to say Kaddish on all these people. Our husband was a good guy. He said, you're right. There's the wisdom of a woman. Fine, let's do it. They went, they met with the Rosh Yeshiva over there. They said, we want to give you guys 10% of everything that we make. Just make sure that you have your, your bachurim. Every day say Kaddish for the sake of... Of all of the neshamot of Am Yisrael that have passed on, that nobody else is saying Kaddish over them. Sure. Giveret, thank you very much. No problem. And Baruch Hashem, HaKadosh Baruch Hu blessed them. They were making money, which means the Maaser was growing, was doing good. And they did it for years. Years, years. One day, as you would have it, the husband dies. The husband dies of this wife. She was a tzaddika. She didn't uh, deal with the business. Didn't know anything. This is back in the day. Women weren't like the women of today. And uh, 
she didn't know what to do with the business business shut down before you know it the savings also withered to nothing and we skin out the poor lady couldn't have the uh, didn't have the money not only to continue giving the maser to the yeshiva to say kaddish to all these poor people that all these uh, dead people that uh needed kaddish to be set on them that you've been doing already for many years but even more than that she didn't have money to wed or uh, to pay for the weddings for her two daughters she went to the Rosh Yeshiva and said I'm sorry I can't pay anymore I just don't have the money it's so sad I don't even have money to pay for the weddings for my daughters I don't know what I'm gonna do the Rosh Yeshiva with the tzaddik says don't worry give it we know you you already did it for a long time we're gonna continue saying Kaddish for these people doesn't well, no money no problem thank you very much she leaves now oh, she got emotional thinking about what is she going to do with our daughters and as soon as she left the yeshiva she started crying 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 all of a sudden an old man looks at her comes up next to her he goes excuse me give it why are you crying she you know in those days it wasn't so common for a strange man to talk to a woman married woman and she looks up and goes oh who are you oh why are you crying oh no my troubles well what's your troubles she tells them listen i have i have no money to wed my two daughters and you know i don't know you know in the ashkenazi world Baruch Hashem, it's much more than the sephardi world so far you know the ashkenazi world Baruch Hashem, you want to get married you want to have you have a daughter make sure you have a, she comes with an apartment automatic the daughter comes with an apartment why you wanted to get married make sure you have a checkbook that has money behind it the way it works Sephardi make sure you show up to the wedding not necessarily uh the same thing why the Ashkenazim have this minag it's not necessarily always so good where every wedding is a lot of promises made big apart and it causes a lot of problems why because sometimes they many times the shiduch breaks not because they uh, the two don't like each other but because they can't afford each other it's a horrible horrible thing or if you want to marry this avrech, a million dollars you need to have half a million dollars it's a horrible thing Sfaradi, yeah at best maybe you're gonna get a chazaku baruch you're gonna get nothing baruch Hashem. i think it's a better minah not to give anything unless you have if you have you have to be generous there's some reshaim they have a lot but no they don't want to give to their kids why we didn't have when we were their age let them not have either your rasha your kamtsan why not give them why not if you have Baruch Hashem why don't you why don't you give to your son to your daughter why not why not oh her father's not giving so what if he's not giving he's your son what do you care give what are you what are you gonna die with it you're gonna bury you with the money Shaim Kamtsanim Hashem who hates Kamtsanim either way back to our stories this lady has this old man she needs money ton of money to marry her daughters and the uh the guy said how much do you need exactly sure it's a lot oh how much how much is a lot she does the calculation the wedding the this the shiva brachot, the house the do, 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 do. she comes up with a big amount of money because okay no problem i'll pay for that she says why you, you have that much money because don't worry lady but i just need you to so you don't have any problems with the bank if you could bring two witnesses so they could see me write the check the lady doesn't know this guy from anything she goes back inside the yeshiva and she tells the rav please can you give me two of the people from here to come with me and he a go ahead lady he tells two of the students to go with her to the talmidim the chulim there in front of this guy this old man he says listen you see my face they say yeah he goes okay so you see that i wrote this check yeah yeah he writes a check for the big amount Baruch Hashem they go to the bank they go to the bank she gives the check to cash the check the teller says what is this because what are you serious because what's serious? what did I do hold on a second she runs to the back she comes back with the owner of the bank he comes back picks up the check passes out falls passes out 
They wake him up, slap him in the face a couple of times. He gets up. What happened? What happened? Where did you get this check, lady? Where, where, where did you get this check? Should I swear I didn't steal it? No, 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 I didn't say you steal it. Where did you get it? He said he gave it to me. What do you mean he gave it to you? The, she gave it to me. Look, I have witnesses. Who? The two guys next to me. Yeah, yeah, sir, we, we, we were there. We saw the man give it to her. He says, all three of you saw the man? He said, yeah. If I showed you a picture, would you be able to identify him? He said, yeah, sure. It was just a little while ago. He goes, come with me. He takes him to the office. He shows him a picture where it's like a class picture where there's a lot of people in the picture. He goes, can you guys point each one to who it, which one it is in the picture? All of them pointed to the same person. The guy fell on his chair again. He goes, oi. He goes, what? I'm not lying. He goes, I'm, you're not, I know you're not lying. He said, last night, I had a dream where my father came to me. My father started this business, started this bank. And my father was a righteous person, kept to I mitzvot. And he came to me in a dream. And he started yelling at me. He says, you rasha. I left you a business. I left you Torah. What did you do? You go marry a Goya. That, you don't say Kaddish on me. The only reason why my neshama goes up to better levels in Shamaim is because of this tzadika that has been giving donations for somebody to say Kaddish on me. And not you, Yerusha. You don't say nothing for me. I'm going to send it to you tomorrow, he says to me. I'm going to send it to you tomorrow. And you better cash that check or else I'm going to come back. His father came to her in his dream. Came to him in a dream to tell him he's going to come. Cast that check. And they cast that check. So the Bahurim ask, Rav Sonnenfeld, how do you know the story is true, Kvod Rav? With all due respect, it's a fantastic story. But how do we know it's true? We are Moshe Rabbeinu, we know it's true. How do we know the story is true? Rav Sonnenfeld says to them, I was one of the boys I was one of the guys that went with this woman to the bank. I was one of the boys that saw the man. I witness story. Akadosh Baruch Hu runs the world. Akadosh Baruch Hu runs the world. No one's ever going to lose helping anybody else and doing a mitzvah. No one's ever going to lose doing the will of Akadosh Baruch Hu. No one. But of course, a person needs to know that they have to help themselves first. If you don't help yourself and you end up falling in other people's hands, you have to have a lot of merits somewhere in order for a Kadosh Baruch Hu to allow such a thing to work. Next, we're almost done. Are there any Jewish books that Noahides are not allowed to read? Is a Noahide allowed to read certain parts of the Talmud? No, the Talmud is not for Noahides. Talmud is only for Jews. Even the sections that talk about Noahides in the Talmud should not be read. By Noahides, because you're not going to know where to begin, you're not going to know where to end, you're not going to know how to use it. So Talmud is, and the uh, Mishnah is not for Noahides. The only books that Noahides should read, if they plan on staying in Noahides, is the Tanakh with commentary, which means the five books of Moses, and then the rest of the writings and the prophets, that's 24 books, with commentaries, the, uh, there's endless amount of commentary by Rashi, by different Midrashim. That in itself is already an endless amount of Torah. And Musar books. Those are the only th- two things that they should read. They should not delve into the Zohar. They should not delve into anything Kabbalistic. They should not delve into, into the Gemara, into the Mishnah. They should not delve into any of that stuff. All the things they have to focus on is the Tanakh and Musar. That's it. People that try to be over-righteous end up being wicked. As the uh, as the Shlomo Amelach says, Al Don't be overly righteous. Uh, next, uh, are there special prayers or sgulot for Hashem except our tshuva? Also for Shlombait, meriting uh, children. Sure, the different uh, prayers. The biggest thing is to follow the Torah, learn Torah on a daily basis, try to do, uh, try to bring Torah into your home if you can, make sure that your husband is learning a lot of Torah, make sure that there's modesty in the house, there's Kedusha in the house, 
make sure you do as much kiruv as you possibly can because the more you care about Kadosh Baruch Hu's kids the more you're enticing Kadosh Baruch Hu to give you kids to give you shalom to give you all the good you possibly can because when you do kiruv and you help other people do tshuva it strengthens your neshama and your tshuva and in essence it turns uh, uh, your past mistakes into mitzvot kiruv is literally the ultimate get out of jail free card it's it's something that turns a person that used to be a criminal into a superstar in Shemaim so it's a uh, that in itself is the biggest zgula of all zgulot uh and biggest prayer of all prayers surely a, a person uh, you know if it's a woman especially Sheree Taylim uh every day there is uh try to take on herself uh instead of reading a specific Taylim every single day like some people do my suggestion is for a woman to take on the daily Taylim which is a uh, reading pattern of the Tehilim where she reads an entire book of Tehilim at least once a week meaning that there's 150 Tehilim seven days a week so you're averaging a little bit over 20 per day every week you're going to finish the book of Tehilim if she has a lot of time on her hands she doesn't work she has a lot of time she could finish even a book of Tehilim once a day or once every couple of days but surely every woman should try her best to finish the book of Tehilim once a week that means that you have to probably put in let's say 20 minutes or so a day 25 minutes a day to read Tehilim and finish the whole book of Tehilim rather than what some people do which is to read the same exact 5 or 10 or 20 every day I don't think that's necessarily a good idea because many times when you read the same thing over and over again over a long period of time it starts losing its meaning uh it starts losing its effect whereas when you read something new every day it uh, doesn't lose the same effect plus is a certain uh, sense of achievement where every time a uh, a person uh, completes the sefer tailing so that is what i would recommend uh there are other prayers also that are uh unique by different mekubalim whether it's a rabbi or uh, or some of the other mekubalim that are specific prayers uh for uh for different things uh you know i have a book that uh talks about different school art. it's a uh yeah, that this book right here this is a uh, this book uh, this book right here this is uh this is a uh, zgulot that Rav uh, Mordechai Sharabi uh he uh different zgulot that he took from different places uh with his tarashah different different uh, chachamim throughout all the generations uh it's in Hebrew only uh different times I have to use this to help with certain people but if you can read Hebrew you could easily get this on the internet or your local uh, Judaica I'm sure could probably get something like this uh there's different zgulot but again I, I the ultimate zgulot number one is like I said doing kiruv to help other people do tshuva uh learn Torah make sure your husband learning Torah that's something very very good to do um but uh if you've done or doing all of the other stuff you want to add a little more seasoning to it you can with something like this it's a it's something that's uh could help uh Jack is asking if someone has ADHD and cannot sit and learn Torah can he just do mitzvahs or is that problematic Mishnah says the world stands on three things so without sacrificing good deeds everybody has to learn Torah because the uh if a person doesn't learn Torah then he's uh, not going to do the mitzvot uh and he's going to become a uh, atheist or heretic or or or, or both uh so uh everybody has to learn to a person who does not learn to has no share of the world to come everybody has to learn to now of course if he can learn more he can more, learn more if he learns less he can learn less but he has to learn some everybody has to learn some if he uh is a uh, has very difficult uh problem uh, let's say reading tough things like uh like the poskim or gemara then no problem he can still read the chumash chumash with rashi commentary is not a problem if he can't read uh, Chumash Rashi commentary it's just too much for him okay he can read a uh, Musar book uh, you know there's certain Musar books that are more difficult certain Musar books that are less difficult uh if you read let's say the Chavot HaDevavot or the uh, Mesilat Yesharim it's uh very the you know these Tzadikim wrote it with Ruach HaKodesh so it's very high level I know a lot of people read those books but very few truly understand the significance of them uh and what they're actually reading uh it's uh, very very deep books and uh requires many many uh, repeats that's very deep books 
another book that's much simpler for example my book it's a very very simple book everybody and anybody can read it the Rishon Litzion read it and the uh the head of uh, head of the bed in Yerushalayim read it uh, Rabbi Yaakov Zamil uh different Tommy the Chamim wrote it and regular Anashim Pshutim simple people uh some that were not even religious read the book and Hashem, all of them loved it it's a much simpler book so there are simple books there are uh you know there are more difficult books but everybody can read some and again he may not be able to read all three four five hundred pages on one day he can read one page he can read a half a page he can read two pages and he can't say no no i can't do it not even a half a page everybody can read a half a page everybody can read uh you know a few lines it's in your mouth it's in your heart to do it you were created to do it there is no such thing as a disease that leaves the person normal and yet he cannot do the uh, cannot learn to the only person that cannot learn to is a person that has lost his ability to determine right or wrong but even if a person has a certain disease such as for example uh, a, a, a a person that has uh, down syndrome uh he could learn Torah in certain regards some people have a heavy case of down syndrome some people have lesser we have an actual real case it's on my YouTube channel my uh, uncle Rav Chaim the father of Rav Ephraim he took on a project 15 20 years ago a boy that had 100 percent down syndrome his tongue was sticking out you know he had that certain look this person was practically left to dead the uh his mother adopted him and but she wanted him to learn Torah she wanted him to do something with his life not be another uh experiment uh that just uh stays the way he is uh for the rest of his life so she took him to Rav Chaim Rav Chaim took him as a project you learn with us well learn with us he's screaming he's yelling learn with us today Baruch Hashem this boy this boy is going to be used in Shemaim as a rebuke for everybody that does that has an excuse why they didn't learn why this this boy he's not a boy anymore he's a man already he's in his 20s he already completed almost the entire shas he is I think three quarters of the way in three quarters more than half the way in last I checked was a couple of years ago he was already 17 masechtot 17 masechtot in the shas he already completed so he's probably uh three quarters of the way in to completing the entire shas it changed the way he spoke it changed the way he moved his whole body changed why learn to learn. watch that video it has if you don't speak Hebrew it has subtitles on the bottom if you speak Hebrew surely you should watch it showing that the Torah heals the body and the soul and everybody has to start somewhere there's no such thing as just doing uh, uh, mitzvot and uh, thinking that uh, we could uh, escape learning Torah Torah is something that is a uh, gives this world a reason to exist without Torah a person has no right to exist so there is no get out of jail free card the only person that does not have to learn Torah is a person that cannot because they have lost their uh their ability to determine right and wrong uh they're you know they're they're uh, autistic and and, and, and uh, in a coma or something like that so as long as a person could learn uh you know uh, can, can watch me he could read a book also he could also oh, he could also watch you in also watch you in but it's you know if a person a person shouldn't make an excuse if he could watch me he could read he could re- read a book too I know some of my guys tell me listen it's hard I love watching I could watch a thousand lectures but it's hard for me to read no problem hard for you to read I know it's hard for everybody to read it's hard for me to read but it's possible it's possible for you to read okay so maybe you can't sit there for six eight ten ten out ten hours to read but you could do for 15 minutes you could do for five minutes you could do for a half hour do that do that don't just say oh yeah I could watch lectures for 10 hours but so that's okay I won't have to read ever no watch lectures and also read even if you're only reading for five ten minutes you'll see over time it'll uh it'll get uh it'll get better it'll get better nobody has an excuse not to learn to learn. nobody has an excuse if I told you guys if I told you guys how much suffering I have to go through and I'm only telling you this to, to help you I'm not telling you this to, to make myself any good any and any look any better in any way if I told you guys if if anybody here if anybody ever saw how much suffering I have to deal with every single day just for me to learn a page and I'm not talking about suffering I don't understand I'm talking about physical suffering if a person literally if they just put a little camera in my office and saw what how much suffering I have to deal with just to learn anything 
just to learn anything certain times how much physical pain i have to go through just to learn anything you guys would say oh, you're in gan eden already you won't need to go to gan eden so no one has an excuse no one has an excuse if i can learn torah you can learn torah if this uh boy can learn torah you can learn torah no one has an excuse all of the chachamim the greater the chachamim the more they suffered the greater the chachamim the more they suffered when they learned torah the 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 amount of agony that you have to go through in order to really learn torah is enormous most people don't have agony most people have laziness most people have excuses don't give yourself excuses you, i'm telling you you're not going to want those excuses when you go up to shemaim take a book read can't read for two hours can't read for five hours no problem can you for 10 minutes read for 10 minutes stop watch a shoe start again another five minutes can't okay another shoe try again try again try again try again never give up don't give up on yourself i wanted to give up myself a million times Baruch Hashem, the Kadosh Baruch Hu sent me a malach called Rabbi Ephraim who kept me alive mamash alive 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 mamash throughout all of these years a million and a half times i wanted to give up on a lot of things because it's hard it's a lot harder than you guys can imagine i don't tell you guys the the other part of the story but Baruch Hashem, we do it we do it every day and we're going to will give us the strength to continue all i can tell you guys is no one has an excuse no one no one no one everybody can learn and learn a lot especially the people that send me 57 messages a day telling me about something they saw on the internet or what their friend ate for lunch all types of waste of time text messages people can learn a lot people waste a lot of time people waste a lot of time make sure you spend your time wisely i know sometimes it's hard for people to read books but you have to build yourself up to that either way always watch you lean, get inspired and don't think that you're going to be Ravavadya overnight even if you can read for five minutes it's good why because five minutes they didn't do it it's five minutes more than nothing one of the Rishon in the previous generation had a Siyum Ashas. Shortly after, he just did another Siyum Ashas. And his Talmudim said, but Kodav, we know exactly where you, when did you finish this Shas? We know you finished the other one, you finished it every year. But a week past, you finished the Shas again? He goes, no, no, this one took me 20 years. What do you mean 20 years? What's, what kind of Shas is this? He goes, no, every day I have different appointments. Every day I have different appointments. And... I figured the time it takes me to get from where I need to be to the appointment usually you know it takes like two three four minutes to get to these you know from the from the car to the place you know there's a bit of time so I took on myself that those few minutes I'm gonna learn to learn. I'm gonna learn to learn. and over the last 20 years those three minutes here four minutes there eight minutes there four minutes there two minutes there one minute there finish the shots another dollar though make sure I have mercy on me I forgot the name but another dollar though he had also a program. Siyum Ashas. What's Siyum Ashas? The time that it takes him to get from his door to his chair at his desk. Every day he set it up. His wife, the Rabbanit, set it up that the Sefer was always waiting for him. He took it with him to the desk, stopped as soon as he got to the desk. On the way out, took it with him, dropped it off exactly where it was on exactly the same page. And every day he would read this literally 30 seconds 40 seconds over a period of years he completed the shots completed the shots that way in addition to all the other learnings no one has an excuse no one no one i'm telling you rabotai if you knew if you knew if you knew what you could have to deal with in shamayim you'd beg to learn torah beg to learn torah people have understood what they're going to deal with in shamayim beg 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 you beg in the streets instead of for money you beg for torah if people understood what they're going to deal with in Shemayim. don't make excuses focus struggle overcome the struggle overcome the struggle five minutes ten minutes a half hour an hour push why you can do it it's in your mouth it's in your heart to do it meaning Moshe Rabbeinu tells us in Sefer Dvarim you were created to learn Torah just like a little robot vacuum cleaner was created to vacuum 
Just like a car was created to drive, plane was created to fly, you as a Jew were created to learn Torah. No one has an excuse. No one has an excuse. No one has an excuse. There's some person that's pretty much just neshama. Just neshama, body doesn't, doesn't function. Shem Yishmo. You have a body that functions? Learn. However much it is, learn. Learn. Learn, learn. Mizot Hashem, you succeed. So the last question, last question. We already went over, but Baruch Hashem, good questions. Thank you, Rabbi, so much. My family and I have gotten closer to Hashem and improved our Torah and Mitzvot observance thanks to your amazing Shulim. Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem. Shtabach Shimolad. Shtabach Shimolad. Thank you very much. Uh, Michael, okay. Are there multiple levels of understanding in the Talmud? Pardes, as in the written Torah, uh, sometimes it feels like I'm missing the main point. Uh, how or what should one look for? Uh, keep it, of course, the whole Torah is Pardes. The whole Torah, Pshat Drash uh, Remez, Pshat Remez, Drash Sod. Yeah, the whole Torah, of course, the Talmud has. Uh, it's not just four understandings, it's uh, a lot, a lot. 70, 70 different facets to the same diamond. There's no end, there's no end. You're going to read the same Masechet a thousand times. Thousand one is going to be different than the first thousand times. There's no end to the messages. The more you learn, the more you're peeling the onion. Another layer, another layer, another layer, another layer. I have certain things I've read a few, I don't know, a lot of times. Read it again today. World of difference. Whoa. How did I not see it? Like When you see it, how did I not see it? But I didn't see it. Why? Just like HaKadosh Baruch Hu or Hagar. Hagar the uh, maid servant of Abraham, maid servant of, of, of Sarah, ran away, ran away. All of a sudden, she's in the desert, no water. Starts crying to Hashem, HaKadosh Baruch Hu shows her the well. Chachamim say, where, where did the well come from? It was always there. The well was always there. Where was it always there? It was always right next to her. Not only it was always there, the well was always there and right next to her. It's just that HaKadosh Baruch Hu did not allow her to see it. Not that it was like invisible. Everyone else saw it. She didn't see it. Why? She had to have the merit to see it. There are certain things that you have to have the merit to see them even if they're right in front of you. Even if they're right in front of you. Even if they're right in front of you. Right in front of you. I, I read it today. May every day be as good as today with the learning. I was learning. I don't know. However long it was like it felt like infinity. Infinity. I'm two hours on this Orachaim. Nothing is I don't know. Nothing. I'm fighting. Fighting. Just to survive, just to stay up. No, no, no. Finally, after two hours of looking at the same thing, all of a sudden, not only is it clear, it's like how did I not how did I not see this? It was like as if I was reading ABC. Wasn't like, whoa, what? no, it was like ABC D E F G. Aleph Bet Gimel Dalit. But you have to have the merit to see it. Sometimes the merit costs you two hours of suffering, three hours of suffering, crying. Oh, oh. how much, how much a person has to beg a Kadosh Baruch Hu, beg. Beg HaKadosh Baruch Hu, please give me Torah, please, please, there's nothing in this world, just give me some Torah, just let me understand what I'm reading. That's it, I don't want anything else, I don't want money, I don't want nothing. Give me Torah so I can understand it. That's it. The person understood what Torah is? Beg HaKadosh Baruch Hu, nothing else, nothing else, I don't want nothing else. Give me Torah so I can understand it, that's it. Let me speak and the emit come out of my mouth. That's it. I don't want no gun ed there. No, no. Just give me Torah so I can understand. It's so beautiful. It's so delicious. Once you have it, oh, nothing in the world. The sweetness of Torah, there's nothing else in the world. But you have to fight. When you have to fight, it's not just fighting about, oh, your wife wants to go to the mall and you want to go learn. No, the fight gets bigger. The fight gets bigger. But if you taste the sweetness of Torah, you do everything for it. You do everything for it. So yes, my dear Michael, yes, there are endless amount, not just four, the endless amount of things that you're going to learn from the same exact thing. As you continue learning, Baruch Hashem, you are going into a finishing Masech, you and your tzaddik son, 
Keep going. Keep learning. It's only going to get better. Thank you very much, everybody, for learning with me. Hakadosh Baruch Hu Yivarech Otchem Bekol Mikol Kol Chaim Arukim Shlemim Meleim Torah Mitzvot Gbiut Chasadim B'Chav Asdachav B'Kol Maasei Adechem. And Be'ezrat Hashem, Be'ezrat Hashem, Hakadosh Baruch Hu will give each and every single one of you a lot of Nachat, a lot of Torah. And for the person that's asking about uh, women uh, wearing uh, bead extensions, uh, it's a uh, she, she has to cover her hair. If she covers her hair with a mitpachat, she uh, I don't know where where the bead extensions are really gonna fit. But uh, it's uh, also uh, you have to make sure that I. Uh, it depends how it looks, who, what, when, and how. Either way, we'll perhaps discuss this more detail next time. It's already almost three hours, and I. Have to uh, have another shoe. Have another shoe in Hebrew. So Bezat Hashem will continue learning more and more and more next time. Bezat Hashem. Thank you very much for working uh, in, uh, through the night with me and, and learning Bezat Hashem. And uh, Bezat Hashem, we'll, we'll learn again uh, next week. Call to Bachav